This is three hours of the very best r slash best of Redditor update stories of the year so far. My girlfriend went on an anti-Semitic rant after getting into an argument with someone. I am Jewish. Me and my girlfriend have been together for three months. We're both 21 years old and I had no idea that she held those beliefs. She's always been a calm, make love, not war kind of person and is very kind to everyone. This is completely out of character and I'm still not sure if she was trolling or not. Yesterday evening, we were sitting in the car and she was talking to some guy from her internship. She sounded heated and they were clearly arguing over something. When she hung up, she said that he was a jerk, a douchebag, etc. Then she started calling him a dirty Jew. I was shocked to say the least and didn't even know what to say. It came out of nowhere. She said that all Jews are extremely arrogant and that they disgust her. Oh my word, that's worse than I thought this was going to be. Wow. For the record, we never discussed our religious backgrounds. Neither of us are religious. She is Middle Eastern, so that's just not something we ever brought up. She continued saying that you can't trust Jews that they're all rats and that she'd rather die than associate with someone so corrupt. I asked her if that's how she really felt and she said, yes, of course. I still haven't told her that I'm Jewish. I'm not even sure how she will react when I do tell her. Should I even bother? It sucks because she's an amazing girl and I'm ridiculously attracted to her, but I had no clue that she was like this. So, any advice? Yeah, my immediate advice is, mate, run. You've only known her three months. That is not enough time to fully know someone and she's clearly anti-Semitic. Anyway, let's see what OP does and let's get into the update. Well, actually, before we get into the update, first of all, some relevant comments. One user has quoted, I'm Jewish, should I tell her and see how she responds or just move on? And then said, yes, how have you not told her? That seems weird. OP replied, I'd just tell her that I'd rather not be with a racist and then leave it at that. I was contemplating whether it's even worth it to tell her I'm Jewish. I've got a strong feeling that she'll freak out. Another redditor has said, this doesn't sound like trolling. Even if you weren't Jewish, do you really want to be with someone so blatantly ignorant and anti-Semitic? That's a good point right there. I don't really care what ethnicity or religion you are. If someone is saying that sort of stuff about any religion or race, I don't care. I'm not going to be with them. And then OP replied, I wouldn't be with anyone who's racist or prejudiced against any group. There you go. I'm just confused because she's generally very bubbly and to see her hate with so much passion is bizarre. And yeah, unfortunately, as I said, after three months, you can't really fully know someone. And if anything, it's kind of lucky that this has come out now rather than in three years. So then moving on to the update, which is posted just one week later. The day I made the post, my girlfriend actually came up to me and said that we should do something romantic for our anniversary soon. Well, that didn't turn out well. Sorry, an anniversary after three months? Okay. Before I told her about my background, I asked her why she holds these beliefs and attitudes towards Jews. She pretty much sounded like Hans Lander the whole time. At one point, she even admitted that she got suspended from school as a kid for teaming up with a white supremacist and pulling a horrible prank on a Jewish student. Sorry, who is your girlfriend? Afterwards, I bluntly told her that I'm Jewish. She did not believe me at all and thought that I was joking. I told her though that I was dead serious and she just laughed and told me to shut up. This went on for a while and she even asked for proof. When it finally hit her, she looked like she died inside. Things went zero to 100 very fast. She got physically aggressive and screamed at me, calling me a liar and a psychopath. She said that our relationship was never real because it was based on a lie and that she feels disgusted with herself. When she insulted me, I reminded her that she really liked me despite my dirtiness, which just pushed her over the edge. She cried hysterically and left. The next morning, she knocked on my door and insisted that she dumped me and not the other way around. She warned me not to tell people that I dumped her since that would make her look bad. I didn't say anything and I closed the door. I heard her screaming and knocking violently, basically asking me how dare I close the door in her face and that you people are all the same. Oh my goodness me. I'm learning now, guys, that this wasn't just a a spur of the moment thing. This woman is genuinely screwed in the head and disgustingly racist. After a while, she left and started writing to me on Snapchat. I blocked her. Then she called me from a friend's phone and verbally attacked me. I've never seen her act so crazy. Long story short, I blocked and deleted her on everywhere and she eventually stopped. I knew that things wouldn't go smoothly, especially after our initial conversation, but I didn't know it would be this bad. Some of her stuff is still at my place. 
oh well. Well, let me just tell you, my friend, you dodged the biggest bullet that I've ever seen. Congratulations, in a weird way. And that's it, really, isn't it? Because imagine in 10 years' time, right, your wife now, you've married her, you've got kids with her, and then she comes out with this outburst for the first time ever in your relationship. And only at that moment are you like, wow, who is my partner, really? Like, how can someone say all this? All that to say that it's kind of a good thing that you know at this point and that you have broken up with her. Thank goodness. The one thing that I'm interested to know is the person, the friend who she was chatting to down the phone, the one who she actually abused in this way, or did she abuse after the phone call ended? I don't know. Nonetheless, I want to know their reaction. I want to know if this is a thing that she has done regularly. The one thing we know for sure is that this woman is absolutely crazy. I mean, like, she didn't just go mental with racist abuse, but then got physical and you know, verbally abusive towards you, even saying you've lied to me this entire time because I really do hate Jewish people and you're one of them. Oh my God, that's on you. That incredible prejudice that I have, that's your fault. Again, the beauty of r slash best of Redditor updates. My boyfriend found out I'm rich and started using it against me. My boyfriend and I met through a dating app eight months ago and we've had a good steady relationship. I come from a well-off family, but my parents never spoiled me. They taught me not to indulge in excess and to keep my privilege in mind when interacting with people. I'm currently living in an apartment with only my salary. Now, I haven't told my boyfriend about my wealth. I wasn't actively hiding it. It just didn't come up. My birthday was a few weeks ago and my parents threw a party at our home. Our home is a medium-sized villa. My boyfriend started scowling when I told him that was the home I grew up in. When I asked him about it, he told me it was nothing and started smiling again. His mood got worse though, as more and more of my parents' rich friends started coming in. When I asked him about it the next day, he just told me that he was feeling a little sick. After we got back, he asked me why I hid the fact I was rich. I told him that I wasn't hiding it, but he started bringing it up in every conversation after that. Like him telling me that I didn't know how to cook properly because I was spoilt. Sorry, is this the same person from the last one? He brought it up with his friends, telling them I was a spoilt princess who had everything handed to me. It started as jokes, but it got more hostile as the days went on. When I brought this up, he told me I didn't know normal people problems because I was rich. Did I do something wrong? And what should I do? And then a couple of days later, we got the following updates. After I made the Reddit post, I tried to have a conversation with him, but he kept stonewalling me. He made more snide comments and I decided to break up. When I told him that I was leaving him, it felt like he was expecting it. He called me a rich, and then word that rhymes with rich, that also means female dog, and went on a rant about how I was leaving him because he was poor. Some commenters told me to expect this, but it still came as a shock. He and I have very good salaries, and I don't know why he said that. He was a good person most of the time I knew him. Some people asked me why I didn't warn him about my wealth. All my relationships before him were with people in my social class, so the expectation of wealth was implicit. Okay, this is the, I'm not gonna lie, this is the first sentence that I've, I've read from OP that I don't particularly like, uh, but we'll carry on. Having wealth was not a big deal in any of my previous relationships, so I assumed it was the same in this one too. It, it, you know, it just comes across a little bit patronizing, condescending. Even if it's not meant that way, that's all I'll say. I'll warn my partners before taking them home in my future relationships. Yeah, that's just silly. This is a tangent, but I wanted to talk about I'm not rich, my parents are, the thing that many comments suggested. A lot of my friends from wealthy families use that line as a defense, but it's misleading. If I wanted to, I could dip into my parents' finances. I choose not to, but it's still my wealth too. It might technically be my parents' money, but it still makes me wealthy. And having wealthy parents comes with a lot of privileges, even if I don't actively use their money. I never had to work a job when I was studying. I had access to the best schooling. I don't have student loans. And my parents' connections open a lot of doors. Having a safety net let me find what I was good at and let me take risks. So unless they are estranged from their families, children from wealthy families are also wealthy. You know what? I do agree with that entire paragraph, I'll be honest. I thank all the people who commented on my original post and gave me advice. I felt like I was doing something wrong, but you made me see that it was his insecurity and jealousy that was the issue. Okay, you know what, for a period there, for a couple of sentences, I was a little bit worried 
the OP was coming across as a little bit patronizing, as I said. I don't know, it felt like she knew she had all this wealth and was kind of just like, oh, it's not a problem. I, I don't know, maybe I've just misinterpreted that. Maybe I have. Looking at that, that final paragraph, it actually did make a lot of sense. I, I'm gonna be honest, I do understand a lot of the stuff that she said there, and she's absolutely right. Uh, I know from my perspective, my parents having, you know, some money meant that I did have more time to focus on stuff. For example, at uni, I could mess around and make silly YouTube videos rather than have a job. That is, I mean, that's not, my parents' money isn't my money, but I've got to be honest, that is a fact. So I do completely understand what she's saying there. The thing is for me, I'm always very careful to not ever gloat at all or even infer that, you know, anyone has any money or anything because it's so irrelevant to how you are as a person but i will say that what she's saying isn't wrong now the one thing that i do don't really didn't really get was saying like she, she kind of makes it seem like a bad thing having money and saying oh i should should i have said about money like from in my experience it doesn't really matter like it, it, it's a weird thing for him the, the boyfriend to be so het up about i will say and that is a bit of a red flag i guess because it's just like why is it a bad thing that that someone's parents have money i don't really understand that maybe you think oh they're so far removed from society i don't know if you if you feel that way in the comments let me know i don't really get it maybe that's my own you know lack of social appreciation who knows but from my perspective definitely a good thing to break up with him i was a little bit concerned that that even though the whole point of the post is saying, oh, why is this person using my wealth against me? You are still saying I'm wealthy, just in a roundabout way. Although I now have slightly changed my mind. Yeah, the only, the only uh, sentence I didn't like was when OP said, all my relationships before him were with people in my social class. So the expectation of wealth was implicit. I don't really like that because that's kind of inferring that people in different social classes don't have wealth you know maybe if you look at the data it's accurate but I, I don't really like that i don't know i know a lot of kids right or i knew a lot of kids in school that had extremely wealthy parents that were horrible and like so like i don't know the word not well patronizing just so unaware well aware but then they made you aware of how wealthy their parents were etc etc and none of that wealth was actually theirs yes of course it is theirs in a roundabout way but they didn't make any of the money it's their parents' money, you know. So that's what I'm trying to get at. Uh, I do think, though, that I probably did misinterpret OP a little bit. And she does seem pretty reasonable. And a lot of the points were very valid. Yeah. Overall, I mean, let's let's take it back a bit. Good thing that you got rid of your boyfriend. That, I mean, that's clear. That is really clear. My wife told me to shut my mouth in front of a bunch of people at a kid's birthday party. Now, this was originally posted on August the 21st, 2022. My wife and I are at odds lately over her sister-in-law, who is also her best friend, who is married to her brother. Long story short, she bends over backwards to accommodate their every ask, including babysitting, errands, etc. This extends to volunteering me to help them without my knowledge or consent. She never sees my point of view or agrees with any criticism of them that I have. We were at my nephew's birthday party today. My sister-in-law is the one who's hosting it, so my wife is super keen for things to go well. Things were going okay. My daughter, who is three, was a bit upset because her balloon animal accidentally was popped. So she's standing with my wife, getting a cuddle, and a boy, older than her, about five or six, sprints into her and knocks her over. She's crying, obviously, and I pick her up. My wife is making a joke of it, saying, oh, she needs to watch where she's going. But I said back to her, don't blame her for getting bowled over by the bigger boy. Now, apparently the mother of this other kid was in earshot, which prompted my wife to tell me in front of one of her other best friends and a couple of other guests to shut my mouth. Then she had the cheek to tell me to not have a moody face. 15 minutes before this post, I sent an email to a divorce lawyer for a consultation. I finally reached my limits. Okay, yeah, I'm not gonna lie. I was sort of expecting that final sentence. Uh, it seems as if this was definitely the turning point or the tipping point, let's just say, to lots of other things that have come before this for OP. We're gonna get into an update almost immediately from the same post, of course. But I will say that, yeah, although it's obviously not very nice to have your wife tell you in front of other people to shut up or shut your mouth at a kid's birthday party i mean to be fair that is pretty terrible some other stuff must have come before that there must be some pent up you know stuff going on there to actually call a divorce lawyer immediately afterwards but anyway let's see what happens next so then the first update firstly i'd just like to thank everyone for your responses supportive or otherwise being heard and listened to is such a mental boost i spoke to my solicitor first thing this morning and we had a good talk he knows that I'm angry and upset at the situation and he says that he'll get myself and my wife in for a consultation if we decide to go down that route. 
The issue in Scotland is that for a divorce where only one party wants out, it can take upwards of a year to get it and evidence of separation in that period. Unless both parties agree to unreasonable behavior as the reason for the court granting the divorce. Long story short, I can't proceed without her buy-in if I want it resolved fast. So I took my daughter to my mum's after this and then I sat my wife down. I told her that yesterday's situation was absolutely unacceptable and that if I told her to shut her mouth in front of my friends that I'd be getting crucified by everyone we know. I told her she was lucky I kept my mouth shut at the party and that I didn't give an F about how her sister-in-law would have taken it. We fought again about her sister-in-law and again, she defended her actions, saying that I'm the selfish one who won't help out my family when they need it. I then did the perhaps petty move of dropping divorce leaflets that I printed from my solicitor's website in front of her. I said to her, I absolutely want to help my family and this is how I do it. I told her about how I was tired of playing third wheel in my own marriage and I told her that I was not prepared to subject my daughter to a lifetime of this subservience. Finally, it looks like what I've said has had an impact. She cried and I think she was close to having a panic attack. This made me feel guilty because fundamentally, I don't think she's a bad person. She's just brainwashed into thinking that her sister-in-law is the second coming of the Messiah. So she promised that when I finish work today, we can have a serious talk about things and she'll listen to my concerns. Right now, I'm not buying it, but I owe her and my daughter at least a chance to sort things out. So I'll see where it goes. To answer some questions that folks had, I know this seemed like an overreaction to something, but you've got to understand that this was the latest in a long line of sister-in-law related issues. Some folks have asked if my wife might be gay and in love, and I have thought about this as a possibility. I haven't asked her yet, but I may tonight. It does certainly seem logical given how passionate she gets about it. Okay, so that is it for the first update, but just a day later, we got a second. So we sat down last night for the crunch talks. I have to give her credit where it's due. She apologized for what she said at the party and she said that she'd also have considered divorce if I'd done the same to her. I reiterated to her that my issue is that she completely makes herself subservient to her sister-in-law at our expense. I pointed out how messed up it was that she didn't immediately take our daughter's side in this incident. The collision was accidental, I think, but I told her that to blame the little one was out of line, which she accepted. I then asked her outright if she had any sort of romantic feelings for her sister-in-law. She squirmed and looked a little uncomfortable. She said that a long time ago at the end of high school, there had been a drunken kiss on a night out, but nothing beyond that. She sort of played the angle that she didn't want anyone, especially her brother, to know about it. And that's why she bends over backwards to make sure her sister-in-law is happy. I asked her if her sister-in-law had ever threatened to reveal this incident, but she denies that it's even been brought up. She just thinks that if the wider family knew, it would bring up a lot of weirdness. She swears that she has no interest in having any kind of relationship with her and that she's straight. I told her I didn't care about what she did that long ago, but that it needed to stop impacting our relationship in the present because I am the thinnest of thin hairs away from walking away forever. She surprisingly apologized again and said that she'd really try to work on it. I told her that I needed to see some proof of that so she can consider herself on probation. I told her that if I feel that it's happened again, I'll be taking our daughter to stay at my mum's. She accepted this, so we're proceeding cautiously. And guys, that was the end of the story for a very long time, a good six, seven months. However, April the 3rd of this year, we got another update. Remember the original was posted in August of 2022. So a lot of people thought that perhaps that was gonna be the end and we're wondering what would happen next. But yeah, in April, we got another update. Now I will just say quickly before we get into it, it seems quite encouraging right now. I mean, the fact that your wife's accepting of all of this and is apologizing. However, the fact that I can see there's another update is not necessarily a good thing, but hey, we'll see. Here we go. I've posted here many times about issues I've had with my wife, most commonly with regards to her subservience to her best friend turned sister-in-law. She's promised to try and work on this given how much it's impacted our marriage, but today I think we passed the point of no return. You see, today is my birthday. It's past midnight now though. This morning, my daughter, who is nearly four, gave me huge hugs and kisses, which was great. My wife gave me a card and told me that my gift hadn't arrived in the post yet. My suspicion is that she's yet to order it or ordered it late, whatever it may be. I then logged into my work and did my shift like any other day. 
My wife was off work while my daughter was at my mum's for a visit Nothing special was planned for the evening because there were plans in place already Just that those plans didn't include me My wife's sister-in-law and a couple of my wife's other friends had arranged to go out for dinner and drinks Because a voucher that her sister-in-law had for a particular restaurant expired soon And my birthday was the only date they could all make Terrible, right? Well, it gets better though because my wife made a big social media post wishing me a happy birthday saying how terrible it was that i had to work all night on my birthday which is a complete lie but it does make her look less bad in public for not spending my birthday with me the issue is because she's done this i now couldn't make plans with friends or family without exposing her lie so yeah great birthday When I think about how she'd react if I'd pulled half the stuff that she's pulled, I can't see it ending any other way than me getting screamed at, even though she's chosen to spend my birthday with her sister-in-law instead of me. On the plus side, I did some Warhammer painting after I collected my daughter and played with her a bit before bed. She also asked why mummy wasn't here, which kind of crushed me. Am I wrong to be annoyed about this? And there we go. My worst fears have come to fruition. It is really not looking good for you two, is all I'll say. Um, First of all, of course, you're not wrong to be annoyed about this. Are you joking? She's actively said that, that she's she's doing something else because you're busy. Like making up this entire rumor and just downright lie on social media to make herself look good and allow her to go and do things with her friends on your birthday. Actually insane. And remember, guys, this is coming off the back of that that heart to heart conversation. Well, I thought it was heart to heart, and I thought the apologies were, were legit back in August 2022 when we saw the previous update where your wife literally he said okay i will focus on the marriage now and our daughter not on my sister-in-law but no on your actual birthday on her husband's birthday she's off gallivanting with the girls uh and that's pretty tough not gonna lie this does feel like this marriage may be coming to an end but there is one more update that was posted 12 days later i'm not gonna give any spoilers but let's just say this is a conclusion here we go i've separated from my wife hi again everyone I just wanted to say firstly thank you very much for all of your responses and private messages many of you were supportive and many of you rightfully upon reflection told me that i needed to grow some backbone and sort my stuff out i've been sitting on this for a few days because the full events of what has transpired since then have blown my mind and have brought home some very harsh truths about my relationship but i also wanted to see if what went down would actually stick and so far it has the fun question out of the way first for those who were asking about my painting i was painting some thousand suns terminators okay so starting the day after my birthday my wife initiated sex and let me tell you this was an occasion in itself i legitimately could not tell you the last time that this happened it's been that long i'm thinking to myself maybe she's feeling guilty about yesterday and she's trying to make it up after the deed was done she turns around to me and says your present won't be here for another couple of days that will have to do for now i'm pretty disappointed at this point not because i had a huge desire for a particular gift but because she felt that her behavior the day before was fine and then for her to think ah i'll use sex to cover up my screw up well that was also a bit of a blow Whatever, I've sucked up worse before and powered through. What broke me was her opinion on her sister-in-law's birthday. Long story short, for those who don't know, she is possibly my least favorite person on the planet due to her parasitic behavior and main character syndrome. Coincidentally, it's a couple of weeks after mine. My wife told me all about her birthday plans for her. She wanted to get her a gift for her favorite massage therapist. What was the big deal? The shop only sells paper vouchers and it's a three hour round trip to the shop. So off she went, again leaving me with my daughter and what commenced next can only be described as three hours of my brain simmering slowly towards an explosion. I took my daughter to my brother's house because I knew that when my wife came back, I was going to explode. When she came back, I was sitting in the living room with a bag packed for me and in an admittedly petty move, one pack for my daughter. This immediately got her attention and she demanded to know what was going on. I unloaded it all. It wasn't coherent and I definitely got more emotional as I unloaded more grievances. I started by telling her it was unacceptable how she completely screwed up my birthday while making her sister-in-law's birthday a major priority. How I was sick of feeling like a third wheel in my own marriage. How I'd literally sacrificed my personality on the altar of keeping her happy. And how I never saw my friends anymore, yet she could do whatever she wanted. 
how I take care of the house despite working more hours than her for not even a shred of gratitude, how she used a lack of sex as a tool of manipulation and control. I cried and shouted. She did the same and vehemently denied all of my accusations. She demanded to know where our girl was and I told her. But I told her that she would not be using her as a bargaining chip against me We eventually calmed down enough to agree that I would keep her at our house while she temporarily stayed with her mum and dad I agreed to drop her off for visits while we work things out. It's been a few emotionally exhausting days I feel drained spent and tired, but I have my little girl and I feel like I have done what I could I don't know what my relationship status is right now. We've not been speaking except to arrange drop-offs and I'm comfortable with that for now. I need some more time before I consider more permanent steps. I've never ever unloaded on her like this before, but Jesus Christ, it felt good, even if she continued to deny everything. And there we go. That is the conclusion of that one. Wow, a lot of stuff just happened at the end there that I can't quite believe, but maybe I should have seen it coming. You know, the whole time, the semi-crocodile tears, the fake apologies. I don't know, guys. I want you to comment down below on whatever platform you're on. Do you think that OP's wife, I mean, maybe now ex-wife, it's getting towards that stage, is in love or at least has some sort of romantic desire for her sister-in-law because she she openly admitted there was a drunken kiss she's lied about other things so maybe she's lied about there being more there and she did seem very sheepish and also she clearly just loves her as a person anyway even if it's not romantic i don't know i reckon there's a lot more going on there that that op hasn't really found out about um because his wife isn't really saying all of the truth i reckon she is in love with a woman nothing wrong with that by the way but i think that might just be the, the cornerstone, the uh, the big key to this entire story. I will say this this whole story was really interesting on, on the behalf of OP because I do kind of agree with some of the comments going along that actually at some point, like you grow a backbone, right? You need to stand up for yourself. Why are you protecting your wife on social media when she's the one that's kind of just being an absolute rat to you? You know, if your wife says, oh, it's a shame that my husband is working on his birthday and that's the reason why I'm doing these things with my friends. Why don't you just say, on social media this is a lie or just tell people yeah that's actually just not true she's just going to see her sister-in-law i get it you want to keep things um you know acrimonious you want to keep the peace but and you're probably a very nice guy as well a selfless guy that just doesn't want to cause too much drama whereas your wife is clearly the very opposite of that but i will say that yeah maybe you could have stepped things up a little bit earlier i do love that you did it eventually op as you said at the end right there, Jesus Christ, it felt good to unload. I feel like you have a lot of pent up things that you need to say there and lots of grievances, as you said, and it's good to actually finally get them out and take those active steps towards a better life for you and your daughter. Let's be completely honest. But yeah, I do kind of think that maybe you could have gone a little bit earlier, given that you had already mentioned about calling a divorce law and all that stuff in August of 2022. And we're now, what, seven, eight months down the line and you're still not divorced. But that's just me. I'm not in that situation. I don't have a daughter, so it's tough to know. Guys, as always, get your comments in down below. I want to hear your thoughts. I, a 35-year-old man, was incarcerated and lost touch with my girlfriend, a 33-year-old female. It's been over 10 years. Would it be wrong to contact her? When I was a university student, I fell in love with Daria. Not her real name, obviously. She was the little sister of my best friend, so I considered her off-limits, but my crush on her persisted and grew. She's one of those beautiful, brilliant people who is alive and breathing to make the world a better place. How could I not be drawn to that? One day, she told me she had feelings for me. And to my relief, my best friend didn't have a problem with me dating his sister either. So, for two wonderful years, Daria was my girlfriend. I should have asked her to marry me. I don't know why I didn't. I suppose I thought I had all the time in the world. We were young and there was no need to rush things. We lived in a country that isn't exactly democratic and we were political activists. I ended up getting arrested and going to prison for nine years. Please don't think I'm some kind of monster for this. I don't want to go into detail in case it makes me identifiable somehow, but we didn't hurt anyone or do anything immoral. What we did isn't even illegal in the country where I currently live and our beliefs were far from extremist. I haven't seen or spoken to Daria since the day I got arrested. My best friend died shortly after and Daria left the country partly due to the possibility that she'd be arrested too. There wasn't any way for her to contact me while I was in prison, though apparently she contacted my dad a few times in the beginning. Things got even worse in our country while I was incarcerated, so my dad and I emigrated when I was released. We've been living in Western Europe ever since, and life is pretty okay. 
I live with my dad and I have a steady if trashy job months ago I found daria online. She lives in a neighboring country seven hours away by rail She doesn't use social media too much But from what i've seen there's no evidence of a partner or kids and even if she's married I'd be content just to be her friend as I was for the first years We knew each other part of me desperately wants to reach out to her and my dad has been encouraging me to do so But I feel like it would be too selfish The circumstances of her brother's death were very traumatic for her And i'm afraid that i'm just a living reminder of all the bad things that happened to us And if she does have a partner would my contacting her offend him and trouble their relationship I don't want to cause her any more sadness Time stood still for me while I was in prison, but I know it didn't for her or anyone else She's done so well for herself She's built a whole life and I don't want to derail that life just because I feel entitled to a place in it She might not even remember me at all and even if she did invite me back into her life I'd be nothing but a burden now owing to my wrecked mental health We've been apart twice as long as I knew her Have I even the right to miss her as much as I do for now? I've contented myself with googling her name every so often and seeing that she's okay It just hurts a lot and I don't know how to make it not hurt. I still love her with everything I have I probably always will. So should I reach out to her or leave her alone? If I do contact her, what should I even say? Now, good news, guys. Update is incoming. But before we get into that, first of all, what do you think? Comment down below. Do you think OP should get in contact? It has been such a long time. But from my perspective, if you still care about this woman so much, nine years after seeing her last... You've been in prison for that long and you still are thinking about her like this I think you kind of just have to do it for your own sake if anything else Ultimately, what's the worst that could happen is what I asked myself to be honest The only thing that I could think of is okay Maybe she's forgotten about you and you happen to then cause an awkward conversation between her and her now partner who you didn't know about That's it. Then they move on with their lives and you at least know where you stand But if you don't do this You're going to regret it for the rest of your life. It's something that you simply have to do, in my opinion. Now, those are my thoughts, but this is best of Redditor updates. And therefore, we are going to get an update to this story. Here we go. Okay, so that initial post was put online on the 26th of January, 2023. And just a day later, we got this update. First, I want to say thank you to everyone who offered advice or kind words. I spent so long feeling ashamed about my situation and expecting most people to react very negatively if they knew. I'd barely discussed it with anyone before except my dad and people whose job it is to help me lawyers therapists etc and i was very surprised to be met with so much compassion from a bunch of complete strangers thank you truly several people asked for an update and that is the least i can do in return i sent daria a message the evening after i made my post it was something like i don't mean to intrude but i wanted to say hello and i thought i'd give you my new contact information in case you ever felt like getting in touch If not, that's completely fine too. I left her my mobile number and email address, wished her well, and that was that. I knew it might be a while before she responded, if she responded at all, so I tried to put it out of my mind. Early Monday morning, my phone rang. It was an unfamiliar number from the country where Daria lives. Who else would ever be calling me from there? I panicked a little bit, but I managed to answer in time. She asked a few times if it was really me, and I couldn't tell if she was laughing or crying. At first, she called me by the very affectionate version of my name that she used to, but then she quickly apologized and corrected herself, which broke my heart a little bit. It was an awkward phone call, but not in a bad way. I was extremely nervous, and it seemed like she was too, but happy also. Some of you mentioned that Daria would want to know that I was safe. And this was more true than I could have guessed. Because unrest in my country increased a lot during the last year I was in prison, she was afraid that they would decide to quietly kill me rather than let me go. Actually, sorry, that's a very good point I hadn't even thought about. It's quite challenging given that we don't know exactly what country this is taking place in. But yeah, as OP has already mentioned, clearly a lot of political unrest going on. You can probably assume from that whereabouts this country could be or what it may be. And therefore, yeah. No idea if someone going to prison would be let out, especially if they were doing something that was against the regime. OP continues, There are documented cases of other prisoners like me having met very suspicious ends in the months before my release, so it wasn't a totally unreasonable worry. Wow, there you go. She also said that she repeatedly tried to send me parcels of supplies and put money on my commissary account but her attempts were rejected without explanation. After my sentencing, I was not allowed to receive correspondence or to have a commissary account at all because of the classification of my crimes. 
so she was forced to give up she told me this as an apology as if i would have been disappointed with her for not helping me more i had no idea she'd done any of that i do know that it was not a safe thing for her to do and i feel terrible that she put herself at risk trying to make me a little more comfortable. She didn't seem to want to talk about what happened any more than that. And so we didn't. We changed the subject to more lighthearted things. Our jobs, the cities where we live, how my dad is adapting to a new country, etc. When she arrived at work and had to end the phone call, she asked if I wanted to continue talking through a messaging app. Obviously, I said yes, and I downloaded it immediately. We sent messages throughout the day, and she even interrupted her commute home to send me a picture of a restaurant modeled after one of my favorite books, just because she thought I would like it. She told me that she thought of me every time she saw it, but unfortunately, the restaurant itself was not so good. I was afraid that she wouldn't remember me, but she even remembers the things I like to read? She remembers a lot of little things, even stuff I forgot. We've been sending messages back and forth ever since, and talking on the phone after I finish work at night until she gets too sleepy. Sometimes it feels like I'm 24, and she's texting me from a few blocks away, as if the next thing she might ask is what's for dinner other times it seems like we're trying to will dead versions of ourselves back to life in order to avoid acknowledging what we've lost she seems a lot more timid than she used to more passive which i suppose makes sense sometimes i worry about how much i've changed and that maybe she won't find anything left in me that's worthy of her But if I could express in words what it feels like to hear her laugh, I could explain that there's also a lot that we know very well. She hasn't lost her kindness or her warmth or her empathy. She still cares about me and I still care about her. I know that rebuilding a friendship after all that's happened will take lots of patience and I have plenty to spare. I'm just happy to have the chance to get to know her again. This morning, Daria asked if I want to have a video call sometime this weekend. I agreed, but I'm ashamed to admit that as much as I want to see her, I'm very nervous. I look so different than she'd remember. My jaw's messed up, and I have the teeth of a hockey player. Fortunately, I will qualify for healthcare insurance soon and be able to have them fixed. I lost weight that I haven't put back on, and I see an old man in the mirror. I'm also worried that I'll get very emotional when I see her, and embarrass myself that way. I don't really cry in front of people. I'm not used to it, and this doesn't seem like a good occasion to start. Aside from not wanting to appear pitiful, I don't want her to feel forced to comfort me. If anyone has some advice on how to handle this, it would be much appreciated. Overall, this week could not have gone better, and I'm extremely grateful to everyone who gave me the little push of courage I needed to send her that message. A thousand times, thank you. Oh, and just to clarify, she doesn't have a husband or kids. As I said in my first post, I only considered contacting her as there was no evidence of a partner on her social media. And there we go. Off the rip, it just sounded as if she was so into you and couldn't quite believe that you'd got back in contact with her. Amazing to have a girl text you throughout the day and really want to be in your life, right? Makes a change from being ghosted all the time. Am I right? Oh, just me? Tough. But what I will say before we get into the final update of this story, which was posted just a couple of weeks ago on the 23rd of March at the time of recording, is that things are looking very good. And I don't really see how they could go downhill from here. I say that with cross fingers. I hope for your sake, OP and Daria's, that this turns out well. Let's see if it does. Okay, then here we go. Here is the final update. I've had a lot of people ask for an update. So here it is. The last two months have gone by very fast. I told Daria that I was nervous about the video call and she insisted on having it right away so that I could get it over with and stop worrying. Seeing her made everything feel real in a way it hadn't before. She still looks like herself or even more beautiful, different only in the sense that she is fully an adult now. The place she lives is very different from our home country with a distinct culture to which she has assimilated. That she had time to adapt and feel completely at home in this place broke the illusion that no time had passed. In hindsight, that was probably the real reason I'd been so nervous because I could no longer occasionally forget myself and pretend that nothing had changed. The hardest part was not being able to reach through the screen and put my arms around her. Sitting there and watching someone you love cry from a distance is not easy. I barely noticed that I was crying too. She didn't seem surprised at my appearance, but she did eventually look me over and ask if the food was rubbish where I lived. I explained about my jaw and that I'm getting it fixed. Less dental work is required than I thought, but I do need surgery. Her response was to ask for my address and order groceries to be delivered, including a lot of soft snacks that are easy to eat and these meal substitution drinks that are actually tasty. She's sent them every week since, even though I tell her it's not necessary. 
When I wanted to pay her back, she laughed at me and said she owed me a lot of food because I'd kept her from starving to death in university. I loved being able to cook for her, and I suppose it makes her just as happy to feed me now. We talk every day and have made video calls a regular habit. It does me so much good just to see her face, and the awkwardness is mostly gone now. It's easy to talk to her. Last night, she brought her computer into the kitchen and talked to me while doing the washing up. It's amazing how mundane things like that can make me feel normal and at home in ways I forgot I could. I never thought I'd be that stupidly happy to see someone washing coffee cups. I'm beginning to think that the idea of home as a physical place is a misconception. She likes to send photos to show me where she lives, what her life is like now. She was curious about how things are the same or different here. I didn't want to admit that I don't have much of a life to share back. Going places just doesn't seem worth the effort. She is, though. At first, it was very small things. She'd send a picture of a pastry she bought at a cafe, saying that she thinks her city has better pastries than mine. I'd go out and get one so I could send her a photo too. Then it was beer, which city has better parks, interesting architecture, a department store, and so on. I figured out quickly that she was trying to coax me into going out more, but I played along to make her happy. I've seen more of my city in the past month than the entire time I've lived here before. I've been to the art museum and finally joined my colleagues for a beer. Usually, I go places for short durations at the less crowded times, but I'm still going, which is something. Daria used to be very sociable, so I thought that whatever happened, at least she wouldn't be lonely. I was wrong. There is a lot she could never tell her friends because they can't relate. They would feel sorry for her and cease to be equals, she says. Our experiences are different, but we're more able to understand each other than other people could. And despite her own burden, she's quietly picked up half the weight from my shoulders without ever being asked to. I am in awe of her, simply for being the kind of person who would. For Women's Day, I sent her some orchids, and she was very happy that I remembered her favorite flower. The things I can do to make her smile are so small, and she deserves so much more than I know how to give her, but I would do anything for this woman, and I am learning. There are protests happening where she is, with riot police and tear gas. Whenever this happens, she feels nervous and has difficulty sleeping. Now, at least, I can stay on the phone with her at night so she's not alone. Aside from the anxiety, there's also a sense of nostalgia. She talks about when that was us making noise in the street. I'm glad she has good memories too and doesn't have to be alone with them anymore. Finally, the reason I am updating now, two months after the previous one. She is coming to visit. We were talking last night and I mentioned that a church near me has special windows designed by an artist she loves and I was thinking about going to see them eventually. She said it would be unfair of me to go without her, so I invited her to come with me. And then somehow it turned from vague future plans to being scheduled for next Saturday. She was going to come for the day, but I told her it was silly to travel so far to stay for such a short time and suggested she stay the entire weekend. So she'll be here from Friday until Sunday. I haven't really had time to be nervous yet, but I'm sure I will. Thank you again to everyone who has given advice or encouragement. It is very much appreciated. And there we go, guys. That is the end of that one. Once in a blue moon, you come across a story on Reddit, which is truly wholesome. And you think to yourself, should that be a movie? Would I pay to go and watch it? Absolutely. I will say I would love to know more about what happened in the first place and why OP went to prison, what this political unrest was, what country this took place in, what era. I mean, to be fair, we know what era. It was 10 years ago. Forget that last bit. Everything else, though, I'd like to see that in the film with a little bit more context. But wow, what a story. It's pretty amazing. It's like a fairy tale, really, but you're living it, OP. Fair play. Jealous of your position? I was going to say that, but then again, you were in prison for a decade, so I'm not sure about that. To be honest with you guys, I feel like we're owed one more update, right? Because again, as I said, that last one happened just a couple of weeks ago, actually less than two weeks ago. So I presume that you have now met up with Daria. She stayed the weekend. My friend, how did it go? I'm on the edge of my seat here, quite literally. I want to know. So if we do get another update from OP, guys, comment down below. Drop a like on this if you want to see it because I know I certainly do. Mother-in-law in the wilds, the insane granny saga part one. Guys, this was originally posted on the 3rd of October, 2016. So this happened earlier today over the course of about three to four minutes. First of all, some relevant background. I broke my ankle and a few toes on opposite feet a few weeks ago. My cast was removed three weeks ago, so I'm mobile now and down to using just one crutch, mostly for balance. This has meant that my brother has been chauffeuring me around everywhere, including to and from work. 
He was running late today, so I wobbled my way down to a supermarket to grab milk, etc., and told him to pick me up outside the store at the little pickup drop off point by the entrance. I was sitting on the bench outside the store when a wild mother in law appeared with her daughter in law and grandkid. Now, I'm not sure how old the kid was, I'm not good at judging kids' ages. But based on her stream of babbling, I don't think she could speak just yet. She was sitting in the little chair thing in the trolley and she seemed to be quite happy. The mother-in-law was an older woman who was walking slowly but seemed to be fine. The daughter-in-law parked the trolley and kid beside me and told the mother-in-law to wait here. She'll go and get the car so the mother-in-law didn't have to walk across the car park. From what I got from the conversation, the mother-in-law had been moaning about her feet and wanted to sit down. The daughter-in-law was trying to get her to sit on the bench and the mother-in-law was martyring herself. I promptly put a stop to all of that by offering the mother-in-law my dry part of the bench and moving further away to lean against the wall. She didn't even look at me before sitting down like she'd just been crowned. The daughter-in-law kissed the kid and told her, mommy will be back in a moment. You be good for granny and then we'll go for a fun ride in the car. The kid's happy and excited for the car ride and the mum disappears. As soon as the daughter-in-law was out of earshot, the mother-in-law turned to the kid and said, You're such a bad little girl. See, mummy's leaving you here. She's gone without you. No car for you. Cue the kid bursting into tears and screaming for her mum. Now, I'm not sure how much the kid understood of what the mother-in-law had said. It may have been all or she could have just understood the no car part. Either way, It's a trashy thing to say to your grandchild or any child to be honest I looked right at her and gave her the raised eyebrow look and some serious glaring Which probably gave away the fact that i'd heard her She completely changed her tune then loudly telling the kid that she was only joking and mommy will be right back Etc. Now this didn't really have much effect on the kid and she was working herself into a right state So the mother-in-law decided to take her out of the trolley seats She plonked the screaming kid on her feet then turn back to sit on the bench. Now guys, this kid could have given Usain Bolt a run for his money. The moment she had her, not particularly stable, balance, she made a run for it, screaming for her mummy, straight towards the road. There was about 15 feet between the road and me, still leaning against the wall, and about half that between the kid and the road. In the time it took for me to realize the kid was heading for the road and that the mother-in-law hadn't seen anything, the kid had made it past the bollard. There are bollards outside shops in the UK. I'm not sure why, but I have theories. I have never moved so fast in my life. I managed to grab the kid and make it back to the pavement before my ankle realized that a full sprint this soon was so not a good idea. Neither of my legs were interested in supporting me after that, so I just sort of crumpled into a heap on the pavement with this kid. The next thing I know, the daughter-in-law is there taking the kid from me. It was her car that she'd run in front of. She was crying, the kid was crying, I was crying, it freaking hurt, and the mother-in-law was still sitting on the bench. Anyway, I blame it on the adrenaline and pain because normally I wouldn't get involved, but I told the daughter-in-law exactly what had happened, all of it. Even what the mother-in-law had said to the kid. When I left, the daughter-in-law was still screaming at her mother-in-law. So there we go then. That is the first post. Let's get straight into an update that was posted just one day later. Firstly, the ankle. It's sore, swollen, and bruised, but thankfully not rebroken. The doctor said it's badly sprained and will set my recovery back, but I don't need to go back into a cast. That's good to hear. So because I had an appointment with my physio this morning, I decided to wait for that instead of heading to A&E last night. Long story short, my physio was convinced that my ankle had rebroken and sent me up to x-ray. Physio department is in the hospital. A nurse or porter, I'm not sure what she was, stuck me in a wheelchair to take me and we got chatting. The nurse said, so how did you manage to hurt yourself this time around? Oh, I chased after a kid that ran into traffic. My God, how did that happen? When was this? Yesterday. And then I get ready to tell the story. Wait, was this at the supermarket located here? Said the nurse. Uh, yeah. Oh my God. That was my niece. That's right. The mother-in-law is her mother. Apparently, her sister-in-law, so the daughter-in-law from yesterday, took off and left her mother-in-law, the nurse's mum, at the store yesterday. She's pretty sure her brother and her sister-in-law are now no contact, as her sister-in-law has been pushing for no contact. But her brother, the daughter-in-law's husband, is a mummy's boy and had been reluctant. Guys, I apologize if the in-laws are getting a little bit confusing. 
This is all in relation to what is coming up though So it kind of has to be this way stay with it She is already no contact with her mother just to confirm that is the crazy granny of this entire story After she caught her pinching her newborn She also told me that her niece is fine, but her sister-in-law got a big fright. Well, i'm not surprised so there you go. It's a dang small world. I had a hundred questions for her, but thought that might be a bit rude. I'm not sure if I ever run into her again. It wasn't really clear where in the hospital she worked or what she actually does, but you never know. Well, one week later to the day, there's another update. So here we go. I really didn't expect to have an update for this again. I was pretty sure it was all over. I was wrong. I had another physio appointment today and ran into the kids aunt again It turns out she's trained to be a physio. So i'll probably see her a lot after my appointment She asked if she could talk to me. So we had a sit down and a chat It turns out the insane granny has gone completely bananas She's apparently got enough sense about her to realize that the kid's mum now has a damn good reason to go no contact Along with the kid and could now probably convince her husband the kid's dad to go no contact too So knowing she is probably about to be cut off she made a preemptive strike against the kids mum and dad she called the police and told them about the incident in the original post except she completely changed the story according to her the kids mum was being mean and neglectful to the kid and the insane granny called her out on it which evolved into an argument while they were arguing that is when the kid ran off into the road the insane granny noticed and ran after her the kids mum then snatched the kid from granny and left the granny at the store no mention of me entirely based on how quickly things have moved They think that insane granny told the police this story on the day of the incident if not the day after I'm not sure what the rules are around the world But here in scotland the police have to investigate and they also have to inform social services Who then have to do an initial assessment talking to the kids school doctor and more Basically, there are a few compulsory boxes to be ticked before deciding whether or not to carry out a more in-depth investigation and there isn't much you can do to stop it. So the police dropped in to visit the kid's mum and dad last Thursday. The kid's mum told her version of events, but couldn't really give many specifics as she wasn't really there. She only really knew what I told her. So the police and presumably social services now have two conflicting reports, one of which claims the involvement of a third party, me. The next day, they received notice that social services would be in touch. This has all lit a fire under the kid's dad's butt, and he confronted the insane granny. The highlights, told to me at least, include her end game is to get custody of the kid. She hopes the kid's mum will be jailed, and she admitted to lying to the police, but is confident the kid's mum can't prove what actually happened because there's no way she'd be able to find me to corroborate. The kid's aunt was told all this over the weekend, and while everyone seems to be sure that both the police and social services won't find any problems, they're understandably nervous. The aunt didn't tell the kids mum and dad that she'd met me in the hospital for two reasons First she didn't actually have my permission to do so and definitely didn't have my permission to give out my contact details Basically the aunt asked if i'd be willing to give my side of the story to the police and social services And could the kids parents contact me i've agreed and the aunt is going to pass everything on to the kids parents Chances are they won't need me to do anything, but you never know I also pointed out that the security cameras for the store would have caught everything and that would probably be the police's first stop So the drama continues Okay, then and then just five days later we got the third update to this story So things have gotten Interesting the kids mum contacted me and we met up for coffee yesterday She's a really nice lady who was under a lot of stress I told her about r slash just no mil That's the subreddit that this story was originally posted on and she said she'd have a browse Though i've got no idea if she was just being polite or not She ended up a bit of a ranting mess, but I don't blame her to be honest She did clear up a few things though The big one being that the insane granny didn't call the police She called a friend of hers who works in the social services insane granny Granny gave this social services friend her version of events and the friend officially reported the kid's mum That's how the police became involved Social services contacted them as they most likely spearheaded by the social services friend Though this is a speculation on the kid's parents part believe the kid to be in immediate danger The police have found that the kid is in no immediate danger, but they're still investigating what happened at the store I'm gonna give them my statement at some point next week and that should hopefully be the end of it Social service on the other hand is a totally different can of worms regardless of how they got involved They still have to do an initial assessment and will also be investigating the incident at the store from what the kids mum told me 
insane granny's social service friend is either pushing everything or is actually in charge of the investigation. So far, this social service friend has mostly been doing her job, though rather invasively. She is allowed to speak to all of the kids' parents' neighbors, co-workers, the kids' school, and the kids' doctor. What she isn't allowed to do is show up at the kids' parents' house with the insane granny to try to force a reconciliation. Apparently, insane granny really went for it with the manipulation and gaslighting in front of the social services friend. She seems to be trying to make the kid's mum look like the insane one. Between bouts of fake crying, she, one, acted concerned about the kid's mum's mental state, saying she must be hallucinating because she's remembering the incident wrong. Two, said that the kid should be placed in her, the insane granny's care, until all this nonsense is sorted. Three, asked her son, the kid's dad, how the divorce proceedings are going. They're not divorcing. She's just trying to make it look like they are to her friend. And four, told the kid's mum that she was glad she was feeling well enough to clean the house and asked her if she'd managed to feed the kid today. Oh, wow. When the parents pulled out their trump card, the fact that aunt is, and now there, in contact with me, the granny started fake crying and asking why aunt and kid's mum are lying to everyone that the kid's mum had dragged aunt into her delusion and that she the kid's mum needs help then she turned to her social services friend and told her that aunt and the kid's mum must be paying some poor homeless girl or student to lie for her i totally called that by the way i knew she was going to accuse me of lying or something similar at this point, the kid's mum admits that she lost it at Insane Granny and was screaming at her to leave. This was convincing enough for the social services friend and apparently the kid's dad to suggest to the kid's dad that he might want to have the kid's mum sectioned, committed to a psychiatric facility. Once the social service friend and Insane Granny left, the kid's parents argued. The gist of it being that the kid's dad was sort of taken in by his mother's insane granny's claims she didn't tell me much about that just that he's sleeping in the guest room now wow i offered to speak to him but she rightly i suppose thinks that he should trust her without outside input yeah i agree to be fair you're telling me that he's believing his crazy mum, the insane granny over his wife i mean that's on him anyway i've advised her to contact social services herself and give them my contact information so there is an official paper trail and insane granny social worker friend can't claim that she didn't know anything about me i've also told her to make a complaint about the social services friend but she's nervous that doing so right now might make things worse so that is where we are right now i doubt there'll be much to update about once i speak to social services and the police but the kids parents are going to keep me in the loop so if there's any more drama please don't let there be more drama i'll update again well guys there is a reason why this episode is titled as part one and as i said in the intro there is a lot more to come unfortunately there are a lot more updates i say unfortunately for us it's just getting started over the next two days you will see these next two parts and let me tell you you don't want any spoilers don't go and try and find the rest of the story right now just have a little bit of patience it's way too long to cover in just one episode but i thought i'd just expand it into three and that way you can think about it in the time off in between videos think what's gonna happen next let me tell you i haven't even read ahead myself too far i just know how long this entire story is and from what i can kind of see just having a little look it gets very very interesting so um yeah stay tuned okay then so the next update comes just one day after the previous one on the 17th of october 2016 i'd asked the kid's mum if she wanted me to go and make a statement to the police or just wait until social services contact me she wanted me to go to the police as she's trying to get an interdict order essentially a restraining order against insane granny so i went to give my statement to the police and oh boy has insane granny done a number on them after the kid's parents told her that they were in contact with me she went to the police and told them that i might come in claiming to have been involved in the original store incident she's managed to weave some intricate lie essentially trying to discredit me before i gave evidence this worked to a certain extent. The officer in charge of the case made it very clear he thought I was lying and had been paid off. He asked me a few times how much I was making doing this and told me that I could be arrested for wasting police time and perjury. He was immediately dismissive of me and condescending, which I'm ashamed to say I don't respond very well to. I think that's fair enough. I mentioned in a comment on one of my previous posts that I work in forensics and I've been an expert witness, both educational and reporting. 
implying that I could be accepting bribes or that I'm lying could potentially kill my career. No way am I endangering my career because some manipulative old lady has an officer wrapped around her gnarly old witch finger. Wow, I love the imagery there. I will say though, this granny must be very skilled in terms of convincing people to side by her. She's got an officer on board. That is elite from her, despite the fact that she is clearly insane. Anyway, unfortunately, I've worked with more than my fair share of people who take one look at me and think I'm some sort of inexperienced daft bimbo. I usually try to assert myself, and if that doesn't work, let them embarrass themselves. It happens eventually. In this case, it happened at the end of the interview, when he asked me for my employment details. My official job title sounds way more important than it is. It has the words lead, investigator, forensic, and a few other ones in there that make me sound impressive. This definitely made him sit up and listen. I'm not gonna lie, I kinda chewed him out a bit, though he mostly realized himself that he'd screwed up. He'd allowed himself to be completely manipulated by insane granny, and I pointed out that it's pure luck that what I do for a living comes with a lot of credibility. What would have happened if I had been some poor student, or someone uncomfortable in this type of situation, or heck, anyone else? So I set the record straight about insane granny. Well, what I know to be facts. I also filled him in off the record about what aunt and the kid's mum told me, which I obviously can't prove. So we had a chat and I got a few things straightened out. One of which was that insane granny did in fact contact the police after the incident at the store. I was originally told that she contacted the police who contacted social services. Then I was told that this wasn't true. Instead, insane granny had contacted her social services friend who reported the incident and somehow got the police involved. It was unclear how. So we think, complete speculation on mine and the police's part here, by the way, that once insane granny made her report to the police and they said they'd be contacting social services, insane granny took it upon herself to contact her social services friend. So we definitely know that the social services friend is not officially involved. A few of you who work in social services pretty much said the same thing. That is shady. So insane granny and her social services friend are basically a rogue duo going around town trying to get dirt on the kid's mum. I've reported her. I've told the kid's mum this too, and the police are now aware of her. So whether they just let social services deal with her or get themselves involved, I don't know yet. The officer also told me some of the things that insane granny has claimed about me. Now, before anyone loses their head about him breaking confidentiality, etc., he never actually gave me her side of the story or told me what she said in her statement. I got that from the kid's aunt. All he told me was what she said when she came in to warn him I'd be making a fake police report. So she's claimed to the police, this is, that I, someone she knows absolutely nothing about and met for less than five minutes, am a poor student desperate for money. I have a history of lying to the police. She knows this because apparently I'm friends with the kid's mum's drug addict cousin. I might be a drug addict, she doesn't know, and that I once tried to seduce her son, the kid's dad, which is impressive as I've never met the guy before. Unfortunately, I gave him all my watts, so I don't have any to spare for you. I also asked about the security camera outside the store. They didn't manage to get anything from them as they're aimed at the door, not the pickup area. I did have a look on the way in, and I thought that it might be a long shot. So what is still to happen? The kid's parents will have an official social services visit sometime soon. Social services will most likely want to talk to me. The police will be going after insane granny for wasting police time and filing a false police report. And finally, there will hopefully be a follow-up to my complaint about the social services friend. Well then, let's see what happens next. Eight days later, we get the fifth update in this story. I don't think you'll need your drama llamas for this update. More likely you'll need your perplexed alpacas? Anyway, it's more weird than dramatic. As some of you know, because of the state of my ankle, I've been staying with my parents and younger brother for the last few months. Well, on Monday, my mum had the day off and was pottering around the house. My parents' place is in a very rural area of Scotland. Our closest neighbour is six miles away and our house is at the end of what is essentially a mile-long dirt or tractor track. It's hard to find and the only strangers we get out here are either forestry people who miss the forest access road or one or two brave or quite possibly lost Jehovah's Witnesses. Google Maps and Satnavs can't find it and no one delivers out here except Royal Mail. At around noon, a car pulled up. However, no one got out. This isn't too unusual. As I said, it's usually someone lost. 
So my mum hung around at the front of the house in case they came over to ask directions. Instead, after a few minutes, the car left. About an hour later though, the same car pulls up and the same thing happens again. Another hour goes by and they're back again. Only this time, two women exited the car. They didn't go to the door. Instead, they decided to have a little snoop around. One tried to go around the back of the house, which is currently fenced off as our back garden is being used as a paddock for a pregnant mare and her foal. The others started trying to look in the windows. So my mum goes out and asks if she could help them. They very quickly say no. They were just looking before booking it back to their car and speeding off. Naturally, my mum was confused enough to tell my dad, brother, and I what happened pretty much as soon as we got home. I've definitely been working in forensics too long as my immediate reaction was that they were casing the place. Now, we have security cameras. They're not for the house or security. They were originally set up around our back garden so we could watch for when the mayor went into labour. They were never removed because the foal turned out to be the reincarnation of Houdini and then we had the mayor covered again. One of the cameras is aimed at the gate that one of the women tried to open to get into the back garden. So we had a little look at the footage. Can you guess who was trying to open that gate? Yep, insane granny was at my parents' place. I have no idea who her friend was, what they wanted, or why they didn't talk to my mum. And I can only assume she got this address from the kid's parents. My money is on the dad. My mum had to day off work as well, but she said no one turned up. However, I have a day off tomorrow, and apart from my brother being about in the morning, I'll be home alone. I know many of you will suggest calling the police for either harassment or trespassing, or both, but in Scotland, trespassing is a civil matter, not a criminal one, so they can't get involved. There are laws regarding trespassing, but they're mostly to do with squatting, and Scotland has a lot of public access laws, which essentially let people go wherever they want in regards to the rural areas. The stalking and harassment laws require two related incidents, and must pass the reasonable person test. If the average person on the street was subject to this behaviour, would they feel threatened, alarmed, or distressed? If not, then there was no offence. The offender must also be aware that what they're doing is causing alarm or distress. For example, if your mother-in-law wants access to your kids and keeps coming around to your house to complain every night for a fortnight, you become fed up and begin to feel distressed about your mother-in-law's constant visits. Your mother-in-law is aware that her behavior will cause you distress and is hoping to wear you down into letting her see your kids. I'm not particularly worried. Even with my leg, I'm pretty sure I could take her and my brother has graciously let me borrow Bernard his old shinty stick with a kitchen knife duct tape to it. When I first broke my ankle, I also gave myself a head injury. My brother and I spent that night and the next day binge watching The Walking Dead, and I think he freaked himself out as two days later, Bernard appeared. Ah, it's too close to Halloween for this. Okay, and that is the end of the fifth update. So just to briefly go over what's happened so far in this story. OP has saved the child from running into traffic after being bullied and released by this insane granny. The granny then gives a false police report to get custody of said child. OP then has a chance encounter with the child's aunt and offers to be a witness, if you remember that was the nurse. Granny then goes to the police station first though and lies about OP. Luckily, this is resolved despite the police officer's failings at first due to OP's profession, forensics, alongside the police. And then as we've just seen, the granny has turned up at OP's parents' home. All right then, now getting straight into update six. This comes on the 27th of October, 2016. So just a couple of days after update five. I'd like to clear up a few things from my last post. A few people thought that I wasn't taking this situation seriously enough. And I think I came across as a bit blasé and unconcerned about everything. I apologize for this. And I want to say that I am treating this incident seriously. And I do not think it was an innocent coincidence. I know this woman is dangerous and always plan to take action. I wasn't planning on just forgetting or ignoring this. I think the problem most people had was that they didn't think the steps I planned to take were enough. For example, I'd always planned to contact both social services and the kids' parents about this and I've been undecided about contacting the police. Posting here, however, quickly convinced me that contacting the police was a good idea. Many of you have also expressed concerns about my family, property, and the animals. Yeah, that is fair enough. You do have an insane granny coming onto your property and sneaking about. This is unfortunately a bit more difficult as it's not my house and my parents seem to think I'm paranoid. My dad was the biggest holdout. But after pointing out some of the rubbish that my grandmother has pulled, I swear I'll post more about her. This has kind of taken over though. He agreed to take a few safety measures that we honestly should have done regardless of insane granny. There have also been a few who don't believe this is real. I haven't gotten messages about this, but the mods have. 
to you, I say I completely understand that mentality. It's hard to imagine that there are people out there capable of this. And I get that me randomly stumbling over the aunt so soon after the original incident sounds like a convenient coincidence. And the insanity has just continued. I get it. I'd be skeptical too if it wasn't happening to me. For some of you, it's even harder to imagine that I would post personal details about both myself and another family. Well, that's what Reddit is. From the just no subreddits to r slash relationships to r slash raised by narcissist to r slash today i effed up they all contain personal stories i mean you guys watching and listening to this episode will know that that is the beauty of reddit however op has changed and omitted many many things to keep all parties anonymous and yet still give you an accurate retelling of what's going on so in that regard yes you could consider my post lies I also have the permission of the kid's mum to make these posts and the police are aware of them too. I am aware though that I am words on a screen to you. You don't know me. You've got no way of confirming any of this and I draw the line at posting more personal details of anyone involved. Yes, even including Insane Granny. This includes the video of Insane Granny. All I can say is that this is a very real and frustrating situation that I hope resolves itself quickly. Though if people or our supreme overlords, the mighty mods, love you really, want me to remove information or posts or stop updating altogether, that is perfectly fine. It's an interesting one and I completely back OP here. Obviously, as I always say with all the stories that I narrate, there is no way of us ever really knowing 100% if they are 100% legit, but that's kind of part of the fun, isn't it? Deciding whether or not they're fake or not. I will say on this one, the amount of detail leads me no doubt. This is definitely a real story. It's just an insane granny. What can you say? I will say though, guys, get your comments in down below. Do you think this story is real or fake? I am pretty confident it's real, but you know, let me know. What do you think? So then the updates. All was quiet on my day off. No sign of insane granny. Sorry, drama llamas, no feed today. I called the police officer who previously took my statement and there is nothing they can do about insane granny being at the house. He also just repeated what I already knew about trespassing, harassment and access laws. Sorry to our Reddit user who had asked about this. I tried, but it apparently barely counts as an incident, never mind more than one. As far as witness intimidation goes, the law, the few that exist, only really protects witnesses and victims when a case goes to court. He also warned me not to try to remove her from the property or set traps, as if she's injured, she can sue. Now, I hadn't planned to do that anyway. The good news is that it's been officially reported and I've sent in the video of her trying to open the horse's gates. Social services also know and have assured me that they're still investigating Insane Granny's friend. They wanted to know if it was that same friend with Insane Granny at my parents' house, but she doesn't appear on tape. I've pointed them in my mother's direction though as she can give a description of the other woman. I texted the kid's mum the night I made my last update and another Redditor gets a cookie or a stiff drink if you'd prefer. She was too busy exploding at her husband to reply but she rang me the next day and updated me. The kid's dad is the leak. He categorically denied giving my address to insane granny. No, no, he's not that stupid. He actually did. He gave it to the social services friend the moron. Apparently, she rang him the day after her little intervention, asking for the witness's address, and he just handed it over. I've not met this guy yet, but I already want to kick him in his special place. I mean, teeth. From what she said, he seemed to be coming around to the fact that mummy dearest is a psycho, but obviously there are still problems. This incident has caused him to slip back into his previous delusions, i.e. he doesn't believe that she'd come all the way out here and that I must be lying to them. So she made him ring Insane Granny and outright ask his mum if she'd been to my parents' place. As she told me this, I was all ready to send her the video so she could show it to her husband and prove that the Insane Granny, his mum, was lying. That never happened. Insane Granny admitted on speakerphone to the kid's parents that she'd been at my parents' place. According to her, she went to confront me for lying to the police and to convince me to follow the moral path and save her family. That's an actual quote according to the kid's mum by redacting my statement. Second, nobody by my name lives there. Third, the lady that lived at that address, I'm assuming this is my mum, had never heard of me. And finally, that I didn't give my real address, so therefore I can't be trusted. The kid's mum told Insane Granny that it was my parents' place, and I was staying there because of my broken ankle, which had been further injured by her actions. Basically, she defended me, and it turned into a screaming match before Insane Granny hung up. I get why the kid's mum corrected her. I do. 
but now it's been confirmed that I do live at that address So she's probably gonna come out again Her friend was never mentioned though and i've sent her the video of insane granny Which won't do much good if she's admitting she was out there They've also had their initial assessment by their actual social service worker and it seems to go well and they'll be in contact soon I honestly can't figure out what insane granny's plan is here I'm very suspicious of her immediately admitting to being at my parents place unless she noticed the cameras and figured that she'd been caught It's possible. They weren't exactly hidden a few other things i've done since insane granny's visits I've moved some of the security cameras to cover the front of the house. Well, this is a lie actually My dad did that. I was just there they're pretty well hidden now. So if Insane Granny and her mysterious friend do get wind of the fact that she was caught at the gate and decide to visit again but avoid the gate, she should be caught at the front of the house. At the very least, we'll get the car license plates. Bonus, Scottish laws say nothing about having to signpost that there are cameras about as they only aim at our domestic property. The foal has been moved. Now, this was going to happen anyway. We started to wean her and get her used to a few things. Her head collar, lead rope, the farrier, etc and get her socializing with other foals pregnant mum is boring now unfortunately the mare is still in there as it's coming into winter now and we don't have anywhere else suitable to put her i'm not overly worried she tends to keep her distance from strangers even when offered food there's not much more we can do with her and finally i also did something i maybe shouldn't have i lifted insane granny and her mysterious friend's prints from the gate and the window there was just a really great set on the window now for a whole heap of reasons These will never ever stand up as evidence in court if anything ever got to that stage I don't really know why I did it. They can't be used in any official capacity But there you go and that is where we're gonna leave it for part two of this trilogy. It's just heating up I love the fact that you've lifted prints. You couldn't even help yourself op not that you could ever use them It's just in your dna. What a pun that is by the way. What a pun nonetheless I for one i'm very interested to see what happens next guys. You're gonna have to stay tuned Turn the notification bell on because the last episode in this trilogy is coming to your faces tomorrow That is right and you're not going to want to miss it and it's going to be even longer than the first two trust me on that one it's about 4,000 words of updates still to go so if you know your words wow that's going to be an absolutely mental one we're kind of at a crossroads here aren't we not exactly sure what's going to happen next but the insane granny and her friend are getting physical now like the fact that they've gone to your parents house and are snooping around just shows that they have no intention of stopping before they get what they want the fact that they've gone to some place in the middle of nowhere up in some scottish valley to try and like just you know bring all this together get you gone make sure the police believe them and not you it's mental and i for one cannot wait to see what happens next so far this story has been brilliant as i said i 100 percent believe it's real and every fiber in my being i mean if it's not then Fair enough, you're an amazing creative writer, OP. But yeah, oh, I'm excited to see what happens next. Okay then, so this is officially update seven of the entire story on November the 10th, 2016. That's two weeks after the last update. So I had an interesting few days. To the total and utter shock of exactly no one, Insane Granny showed up at my parents' place again. I was there alone and heard the doorbell, but not the car pulling up. I answered the door and insane granny was standing with another woman who claimed to be from social services I suspect that this is the elusive social services friend that has been helping She wanted to interview me about the original incident and my police reports I didn't let them into the house and told social services lady that there is no way i'm giving her my statement with insane granny present She shouldn't even be here and I should have been contacted before she randomly showed up Social services lady then backtracked a bit and said that it was just a friend unofficial visit to discuss me redacting my statement to the police before i could react to that insane granny opened her mouth and asked in a sickly sweet voice why won't you let us in the house is it because it's full of drugs hey you what i know she's been telling people this but that was rather on the nose i ignored her and told them both to leave while she tried to peer around me and into the house social services lady kept pushing for an unofficial interview and then said they could wait while i tidied away the drugs if that made me more comfortable at this point i realized they're both completely insane and i probably won't be able to reason with either of them so i asked them to leave again and told them i would call the police if they did not comply not exactly a bluff i would definitely call them it's just that i know that there is absolutely nothing they can do but I was hoping the threat of it would make them leave. Then insane granny opened her mouth again and asked me, how much do you make working as a whore? 
She was oddly calm when she asked these questions like she was asking me about the weather It was creepy as anything. I assumed she wanted a big reaction from me to make me look like the crazy one She didn't get one I just blinked at her and took up my phone to call the police. I didn't even manage to start dialing before social services ladies said they were leaving and asked me when I'd be available to give my statement to her. I told her if social services want to interview me, it will be a different social worker and would be at my place of employment. Then I gave her my business card. My purse was just inside the door. That shut her up and she started to walk back to her car. Insane granny, however, wasn't happy that social services lady wanted to leave. She suddenly went from creepy calm and sweet to screaming at me. She had a proper tantrum too, stomping her feet and flinging her body about. She even started kicking one of my mum's planters repeatedly. I don't know if she was trying to break it or kick it over, but she just kept ramming her foot into it while screaming that I'm a lying little female dog, taking her baby away from her, scum, trying to ruin her life, just like the kid's mum, a and a slut. And yeah, those two have just been censored, but I'm sure you can probably work out what they might be. I just turned around, went into the house and closed the door on her. I could see from the window that social services lady had pulled the insane granny back to the car. They sat there for a few minutes talking before the insane granny just lost her mind in the car. I have no idea what she was saying, but she was banging her fists on the dash and throwing herself about. The car was actually shaking. Two minutes later, they pulled away. And I have the entire episode on tape. I rang the police officer that I've been dealing with and met with him yesterday to report this and give him the tape. This definitely goes down as an incident of harassment and I've spoken to HR at work who were setting up a meeting for me with a solicitor. I've also complained to social services again and updated the kid's parents. I also saw on the tape that before they rang the doorbell, they went snooping again. Not near the horse this time, but they were looking in the windows again. I'm not sure what will happen with this. I'm hoping social services lady has come to her senses and dumps insane granny's butt. Or she tries it at my work, which won't go well for her at all. All right, then that is the end of the seventh update. But let's not wait around. Update eight comes two and a half weeks later on the 28th of November. So I only found out about this today and I'm writing it up in the middle of a staff meeting. So bear with me. I rang the kid's mum on the way into work and it just all came out. She was too upset and it's too early in the process yet to answer a lot of questions. So basically, I know what you know or are about to know. Firstly, I met with a solicitor through work. I've had to do it this way in case insane granny attempts to approach me while I'm at a crime scene. He doesn't think there's enough for a non-harassment order, but he's gonna try anyway. This isn't costing me anything, so he can do what he wants. We put a few safety measures and deterrents in place that I'm not going to mention here just in case. Wow, imagine if Insane Granny was tracking her on Reddit too. I rang the kid's mum this morning to update her about my solicitor and she gave me an update on Insane Granny. Oh boy, is she living up to her name. She rang the kid's dad while he was at work last week and left a series of ranting messages. Most were about how she was done with all the petty fighting, how everything was the kid's mum's fault, he never should have married her, etc. In one, she told him she was putting her foot down, that they were leaving and that he should meet her at the airport as soon as he left work. He, in what I assume is a very rare moment of intelligence, I'm not a fan of this man if you couldn't tell, completely ignored her and instead went home after work. Any bets as to what he found when he got home? If you guessed a wide open front door and a ransacked house, you win a cookie and a stiff drink. If you guessed insane granny packing his clothes and belongings into suitcases, you win two cookies and a double shot of your stiff drink. If you guessed all of the kid's clothes and toys packed into insane granny's car, along with the actual kid, you win three cookies and a triple shot. And if you guessed all of the above, congratulations, you win a bakery and a pub. Guys, if you commented that, then I'm gonna have to supply the bakery and the pub, free of charge. It's gonna be my expense, OP says so. Yep, insane granny was still on the pickup list for the kid's nursery. Don't worry, this has been fixed. So she'd packed all her stuff, nicked the kid, used the hidden spare key to get into the parents' house, packed her son's and granddaughter's belongings, including their passports and birth certificates, and loaded up the car with the intent of heading to the airport and leaving the country. I'm not sure what the kid's dad's reaction was, but he did phone his wife, the kid's mum, and tell her she didn't need to pick the kid up from nursery. When she told me this, I believe my reaction was, oh, how freaking thoughtful of him. 
Then I eye rolled so hard they fell out and I lost them. So if you see them, nearsighted, blue, I'll pay for shipping. Anyway, the kid's mum heard Insane Granny in the background of that phone call and got the story out of him. I think you guys will probably heard her roaring when she found out Insane Granny's plan. She immediately called the police while she sped her way home. The kid's mum pulled up before the police did and she immediately got her kid out of Insane Granny's car. When she entered the house, Insane Granny lived up to her namesake and went insane at her. I wasn't given details about what she said, but there was apparently a lot of screaming about the kid's mum stealing her baby and ruining her life and more. I've got no idea what the kid's dad was doing at this point. The police arrived and insane granny instantly shut up and became all sweet and calm. She pulled this act with me the last time I saw her. It's creepy as anything. The police separated the kid's mum and insane granny to take statements. And once again, insane granny lied to them. She claimed that the kid's dad had let her into the house and that she was helping him move out as the kid's parents were divorcing. I think she was expecting the kid's dad to just roll over and go along with her, like usual. Instead, though, according to the kid's mom, he just looked really defeated and told the police, no, that's not what happened. So Insane Granny was arrested for theft by housebreaking, which is basically breaking and entering. But Scotland is a special little snowflake and doesn't have breaking and entering. Instead, we have housebreaking, which isn't illegal unless there was also intent to steal. We also don't have burglary. Instead, we have robbery which is theft with violence or the threat of violence. And we have theft, which is, well, theft. Interesting Scottish laws here. Editor Stevo editing this. Your thoughts? I think it's a little bit weird. Oh, and apparently the kidnapping rules are also weird too. England and Wales have kidnapping laws, but Scotland has abduction laws over the age of 12 and plagium laws, children under the age of 12. None of them count in this situation as Insane Granny technically still had permission to pick the kid up from playgroup and she took the kid to her primary residence. Yes, she planned to leave the country with her, but the fact that she planned for the kid's dad to come too, she even had a plane ticket for him, counts as having parental permission to take the child out of the country, as technically the kid would be in her dad's custody. Regardless if this was by design or not, she's very good at just skirting the edge of illegal and dancing about in the legally grey area. Anyway, she was charged and then released on bail, so she's still out there. The kid's dad seems to have seen the light though, which is good, and they've started cracking down on their security now too. She's been taken off the nursery pickup list, they're changing the locks, security cameras, the works. Well, that is good to hear. Oh, and social services got back to them and gave them the all clear. They're not taking their investigation any further. And there we go, guys. That is the end. A happy ending for once. Oh no, I'm only joking. One week later, here's another update from the 6th of December. I mentioned last time that Insane Granny is out on bail. She's electronically tagged, has a curfew, and is not allowed any contact with the kid's parents or the kid. This includes being near their house, workplaces, the kid's school, and more. She's also being charged with a few other things for some of her previous actions relating to me. Now, I'm not going to actually say what these charges are, as the court rolls are public, so anonymity would be right out of the window. But this does mean that she's not allowed to contact or be near me either. Yay! Personally, I'm hoping this is the end of it, but history has shown I'm not that lucky. The kid's parents are still together, though from what the kid's mum has said, this is only so the kid can have a nice Christmas. She seems to have the same problem that a lot of you here do. She thinks her husband is perfect in every way, except for when it comes to pretty much everything regarding his mother. But he's agreed to counselling, so we'll see what happens in the new year. I spoke to the aunt as well. She's completely on the kid's mum's side. She doesn't have anything nice to say about her brother, the kid's dad, right now. Wow. That said, she has been telling me some stories about their childhood, and I'm pretty sure Insane Granny is evil in its purest form. Social services friend has been struck off. I had an interview with their investigative committee or whoever and gave my witness statement. She has an interim order, so she can't work in any form of social services at all. I've got no idea how long that lasts, but she was found to be a danger to the general public and service users. So I'm hoping a long time. I'll also be on her Disclosure Scotland, so I doubt she'll ever work with the vulnerable again. There'll be a hearing sometime in the next six months or so that I'll be testifying at too. And I think that's it really. We're keeping the security cameras around the house, and I'm actually moving back to my flat sometime in the new year, which I'm looking forward to. And then, four months later, on the 15th of March 2017, we got this. 
the final huge update to this tale. I know for some of you, it won't be enough, but I've taken photos because I've thrown my uncooperative idiot of a scanner out the window of my witness citation and my original complaint about the social services friend and redacted them worse than anything that ever came out of Area 51. Obviously, I can't prove everything or even have copies of everything, and I'm not going to ask the kids' parents and others for their documentation just to post it here. Right then, so having a quick look at this, you can see it is from the Scottish Courts and Tribunal Service. It all looks pretty official to me. Obviously, a lot of stuff has been removed, personal details and such. Moving on to the second one, make a complaint about a worker registered with the Scottish Social Services Council. Well, that is exactly what OP claims to be doing. Yeah, all the stuff has been crossed out but it looks very legit ah and now we see what is really legit the actual story in itself yeah with everything crossed out if you are watching on youtube you can see but this is the exact same story that op has been telling us on reddit just written in an actual complaint form now if op has faked all of this to this extent i mean there's loads here i'll put everything on the screen but there is absolutely loads loads and loads of pages let's just flick through them all wow it's signed as well that uh fair play You've conned us all, but uh, yeah, it's pretty obvious by this point. If it wasn't already, that this is a completely legit story. Okay, so the last time I left you, Insane Granny had been released on bail and wasn't allowed to contact the kid, her parents, or me. She didn't even get a chance to contact the kid or her parents, as the kid's mum decided to visit her parents somewhere in Englandshire for the holidays. The kid's dad did go with them on the condition that if he, at any time, opened his mouth in defense of insane granny the kid's mum would file for divorce that day they are still together so he must have shut up as far as i was concerned this was over the only problem i had is that when someone is electronically tagged a condition of her bail they need the addresses of the places they're not allowed to go so that they know not to go there in my case this was my parents place where she'd already been my main office which she knew from my business card and my own flat Thankfully, my flat has two security doors and I'm never there. My parents had also decided to redo their driveway before Christmas too. This was something they'd been planning for a while and decided just to do before they put in a security gate. As a result, their driveway was completely unusable and the only access to the house was a long, unmarked tractor track that involved a bit of off-roading. Essentially, she couldn't get to me at home and my workplace is basically a police station, so I was happy enough to think that, apart from court, I would never have to lay eyes on insane granny again. Yes, I know I'm a moron. Bail and being electronically tagged barely slowed insane granny down. With her son, daughter-in-law and grandchild in the wind, she had no one to turn her insanity on. Oh no, wait, that's not right. She had me. You see, the building I work in is rather big and sprawling, has multiple entrances and a police station in front of it. As a result, the building also had multiple addresses. Because of my leg, I don't know if anyone remembers, but I broke it a while back being a moron, I haven't been driving to work. Instead, my brother has been dropping me off. This has meant that I've been entering and exiting the building through the police station instead of the lab entrance. The police station which has a different address to the lab. I had no idea, but apparently this meant that nobody was notified when insane granny started parking herself across from the entrance to the police station. I never noticed her park there, nor did I notice when she started following me out to crime scenes. Yep, but it gets worse. Here's that seems like it's irrelevant, but actually it's relevant information that I warned you about. Most of you know that I work in a branch of forensics that deals with really dead people. Very few of our cases turn out to be criminal. The main case I was working at the time, still am actually, was such a case. It was in a rather rural area with multiple sets of remains found in a place where there should be human remains, just not quite in the situation they were found in. I know, be more vague OP, but think of something along the lines of a funeral home fire. Nothing suspicious and you'd expect to find remains in the debris. This was a similar situation. However, dead humans found in odd situation usually means there has to be an investigation just to make sure the remains are who they're supposed to be, that they're all accounted for, nobody was slipped in on the sly, etc. For a number of reasons, it was decided that we, Reed I, would just set up a mobile lab in an isolated building not far from the original scene instead of moving everything to our lab. The building was similar to a town hall or a dance studio or something. It mostly consisted of one large room with two smaller storage rooms at the back. One room had a fire exit that could only be opened from the inside and the other had a single door that we were using to get in and out of the building. 
The front of the building had a set of double doors that led into a small entryway with toilets on either side and another set of double doors in front that led to the big main room of the building that I worked in. Both sets of doors were unlocked so I could get equipment in and out. However, when I wasn't moving equipment, there was a police car parked in front of the doors and the area was roped off with police tape. I swear to frick, this is all relevant. Now on screen right now, if you're watching on YouTube, OP has actually done a kind of map of everything going on here, labeling themselves and the position of other officers. It's a it's an amazing paint job, I will say, but it helps give some sort of indication visually as to what is going on here right while this wasn't an active crime scene op was still working with forensic evidence which technically belongs to police scotland and the crime lab so they had two to three uniformed officers on rotation as security i'm going to name them officers one to three and again on the map you can kind of see where they are so officer one is right over to the left just chilling out officer two is near the fire exit at the back of the hall and officer three is coming from the right. And remember, this is a forensic thing. You know, it's police taped. A normal civilian can't get involved here. So there I am working away by myself when officer one comes sprinting in, telling me to drop everything and GTFO now. He actually hauled me out the last few feet as I apparently wasn't moving quickly enough. He drags me out and around to the front of the building. I think you've all pretty much guessed who was there. Yep, insane granny was outside being insane. Or more accurately, she was kicking and screaming on the ground while officers two and three tried to restrain her. So naturally, I stop walking and start doing my best impression of a fish while my brain nopes the frick out and I vaguely hear the sound of an old dial-up modem as my brain tries, in vain, to reconnect with reality. Meanwhile, she's shrieking like a toddler and officer one is basically dragging me under the police tape and across the road while talking about getting to a safe distance. Why exactly did we have to get to a safe distance? Because insane granny had opened the building's first set of double doors, dumped a few petrol cans and propane tanks in the entryway and doused the lot in petrol? The only reason the whole place hadn't gone up in flames, other than the fact that propane tanks come with safety valves, so it is rather hard to explode them, was because Officer 3, who just pulled up from his shift, had caught her walking towards the front door from the right side of the building. Oh my days. When she saw him, she made a run for the front door, but he was faster. When he got to her, she had a lighter in her hands and he could smell the fuel inside the building. That was enough for him to realize she was actually a threat and not just some nosy female dog so he took her down and dragged her away this alerted officer two to the situation he was stationed outside the single door around the side and the two of them tried to restrain her while officer one who'd been somewhere along the perimeter of the original scene was sent to get me out once more we're going to flash the photo up on screen right now you can see that officer three came from the right officer one was way away on the left and officer two was at the back but wow insane granny just came from out of nowhere and would have probably been able to set this entire place on fire if officer three wasn't coming for his shift that is crazy so the question is what was insane granny doing around the right side of the building well she was parking her car up against the fire escape so it couldn't be opened yep she basically tried to trap me in a building and set fire to it i'm not going to go into specifics here but she screwed herself royally by trying to set that particular building on fire not only because she attempted to trap people mainly me but she didn't know who else was in there inside but remember when i said it was being used as a mobile lab yeah that meant it officially contained material that was and is still considered evidence in an ongoing police investigation and she did all of this while out on bail Elevating the charges to aggravated and guaranteeing her a prison sentence measured in years Also to add a lot of people are asking about what she's being charged with This incident happened before christmas and her bail for the original breaking and entering charge was immediately revoked And she was denied bail for her second set of charges in scotland If you're denied bail your trial has to happen within 110 days So the trial happened pretty freaking quickly she is currently in prison. I'm not going to give a list of charges. I've got no idea if you'll be able to find her from that, but I'm just not going to risk it. But yeah, they were serious. I'm also not giving her exact sentence for the same reason, but I will say that it was for over three years. The kid and the kid's parents were told about this incident the day it happened and were at the trial. They're still together. The kid's dad apologized to me a few times, and he's not, as far as I'm aware, defending his mother anymore. 
I hope this cleared up a few things. And there we go. That is going to do it for this incredible, insane granny story. That is the end of part three. No doubt one of the most enthralling tales I've read on Reddit. That ending has shocked me to my very core. Despite all the stuff that this insane granny had done in the past three videos, I just didn't expect that. Attempted murder? Like, what has she gone down for? You say three years. Surely it's more than that. She knew you were in there. She's tried to set the place on fire. Doesn't even matter that it's a police scene, like, or a lab. And then she's blocked the fire exit. Does that not scream attempted murder? To me, it does. I would actually just love to know exactly what her charges were and how long she really is in prison for, but I guess we'll never know. My fiance got a face tattoo without talking to anyone. I am honestly stunned right now. My fiance, Kim, I have just learned, is completely insane. She took some days off work this week, sick, and avoided seeing most people in person. She claimed she was feeling sick and just wanted to stay home alone. She's never given me any indication that she would lie about this in the six years we've been together. No one in her family had any worries because she was a stable individual who'd never do anything crazy. She got a face tattoo. She took three sick days from work to recover from the fact that she got a face tattoo. She told no one of this plan beforehand. I've never in our time together been talked to about tattoos by Kim. She showed no indication that she was even interested in getting any. I was not even the first to learn. Her sister visited her because she got worried after Kim cancelled meeting with her for lunch on her third day sick and got the the grand reveal she did not tell anyone beforehand because she didn't want to be talked out of it and she hid the results because the swelling and redness was so bad that we would react badly and not be able to understand the artistic meaning kim is asian american she got japanese symbols going down her forehead and under her eye i don't know the meaning of them i don't really know if i care to know the meaning of them kim's parents are japanese immigrants according to her sister who was nice enough to inform me of this whole debacle this is a big no-no in japanese culture Tattoos have links to crime and are looked down upon. Her parents are beside themselves and that is a whole other set of drama I can't even begin to approach. Kim talked to me last night about her and acted offended and started a fight because I told her it was absolutely insane of her to do this. She works a public facing job. She talks face to face with clients in the financial industry. The minute her boss finds out, the career she went to school for will be over. She actually didn't consider her job or family or me at all and decided a long time time ago she was going to express herself freely without any concerns i'm worried about her right now this is not normal she blocked my number after our fight and is ghosting me and her sister because we're trying to help but dear lord this is far beyond me i cannot comprehend what i'm even supposed to do right now kim's lost her mind is there any chance i will be happily married to this a woman who went and got a face tattoo and hid that fact because she knew we would all talk her out of it Dear Lord, I really need to run, don't I? The engagement is pretty much off. Kim has told me she never wants to see me again, and I woke up this morning with her ring and a box of stuff I gave her on my porch. I don't know what's going on with her. Her sister and family have been trying their best, but nothing on their end is working. I brought up to her sister the idea that this is a mental breakdown, and they're looking into getting her help. It's painfully slow, considering Kim is not responding to anything and is refusing to talk to anyone. I really don't know what to say here, I guess. To answer some questions, Kim is 29 and I'm 28. In the seven years I've known her, she's never acted like this at all. She has a good relationship with her parents. And while they were a bit overbearing at times, they supported her in going to college and getting a career rather than starting a family. From what I've gathered, they probably would have been fine with any tattoo she got as long as it was not on her face, neck or hands. Even then, this kind of behavior is as far from Kim as I could have imagined. She just lost her mind out of nowhere. It's not like I can do anything about it either. She's blocked my number and does not want to see me. I'm just at a loss for words. One day I'm engaged and the next I'm not and my ex has a face tattoo. I mean, what a story to start off today's episode with. I will be honest with you guys. This to me screams like some form of manic episode. It's so far out of her natural character from all you are saying. And it's not just you, OP, that's saying this. It's her entire family as well. And you've been with her for seven years and you've never seen her be like this even a tiny bit. Yeah, I'm no psychologist, but that screams to me that something has gone wrong there. Especially because it just makes no sense as well. Like she is literally throwing away her career, her education, her life her job, maybe even her parents, 
Like something's definitely going on here. And I don't want to try and guess what's going on, but yeah, it's clearly not very good. And I think ultimately she needs some help. How can I manage the resentment my 25 year old girlfriend and I, a 42 year old man, have for each other? I know I'm going to get a lot of trash for the absurd age gap and the way we started. And I agree and I deserve it, but I would really like some genuine advice past going to counseling. She won't agree and I can't afford it anyways. Tangible things that I can work on and introduce to help us, either as a couple or as effective co-parents. Long story short, my ex-wife and I were together since middle school. We have four daughters in their teens. I was a stay-at-home dad and part-time worker for most of my life until my youngest was in middle school. My ex agreed to invest in a passion project business of mine. I hired a receptionist. We started an affair and she baby trapped me. Now we're living together and have a young son. She resents me because she feels she was fooled. She saw me as a business owner who had a nice car, nice clothes, took her to nice places, etc. She thought I was rich, so she got pregnant on purpose. She admitted it, that's not an assumption, hoping to use me to not work and sponsor her family from overseas. Well, actually, my ex-wife and her family are the rich ones. None of our homes were in our names. We were renting from her parents and giving them a nominal fee with the expectations that these homes would be left to my ex and me after their death. This allowed my ex's salary, roughly 150,000, which isn't actually huge in this high cost of living area, to stretch, and we lived a really good life. I left our marriage with half our savings, roughly 25K, and my personal property and car. I lost my business due to lack of funding and I did not seek alimony. I resent her because I feel I was fooled. I thought she loved me and couldn't believe the interest a young, hot woman showed in me. She was incredibly persistent and pursued me strongly but she has no feelings for me, no care or desire. Now that the ruse has dropped, I can't believe I gave up my entire life for what I see as an ego trip. I loved my ex-wife, really I did and still do, but I'd never been with another woman and any attempts to open our relationship were shot down. This was like a wet dream come true and I was weak. Now, both me and my girlfriend are in a place we didn't imagine. She's living in a trashy apartment with an old man and still has to work. I've lost my kids, the love of my life, my family, my lifestyle, my business, and it's all 100% my own fault. She stopped being intimate with me as soon as she found out I wasn't rich. We're still together on my end because I feel like I need to have something to show for this trash show of a situation. At least I got a son and a partner out of it. At least it wasn't for nothing. And also, because I don't trust her with our son. She would never agree to give me full custody, and she's not a good mother. I'd be worried for his safety and the people she would have him around. I honestly don't know why she hasn't left me from her end. What can I do to improve this situation? I know logically it would be best to break up and co-parent, but I'm afraid for my son and I'm embarrassed for myself. Is there a way to salvage this situation? I'm thinking of just telling her we can have an open relationship. She can sleep with whoever she wants and go wherever she wants as long as she lives here so I can have my son 100% of the time. I work from home. I don't know if that's the answer here though. Okay, wow, what a story. Before I even give any thoughts, there's a very important update that was posted just a week later. Let's get straight into that. I had an affair, my ex-wife divorced, me and my kids absolutely refused to speak to me i was an incredibly involved dad most of their lives i worked one to two days a week and then stayed home with them the rest i was closer to them than their mum, and i'd like to think i've never disappointed them before this i made a mistake it's been over two years since it all came out and i haven't been able to make any headway my eldest is hung up on the fact that i now have a young son Every firstborn of each generation in my family has been a boy for a long time and she broke the streak. I honestly could not care less about that. I've always thought that pressure was stupid and I'm not a traditionally masculine guy that always wanted a boy, but she's so hurt that I have a son and is convinced that's all I've ever wanted and he's replaced her and my daughters. None of that is true. All of my girls said they don't consider themselves to have a brother and want nothing to do with him. All four of them feel betrayed and blame me for breaking up our family. I deserve the blame. It's my fault and I take responsibility. But I can't change the past and I don't know how I can begin making up for it. My ex has full custody of them, but I'm supposed to have visitation one weekend a month. They're all in therapy and it was suggested to not enforce a visitation and respect their boundaries while they work through it. 
I've done that the entire time and there's no progress made. Does anyone have any suggestions about what I can do here? My ex absolutely hates me, but was always supportive of the girls staying in contact with me. She's respected their wishes, but still gives me updates once in a while. My eldest is turning 18 soon and graduating this coming year and probably moving away for university. I feel like the time to make up with her, especially, is slipping away. I know I'm the trashy person here. I was a terrible husband, but I was honestly a really good dad and I miss my girls. Has anyone been through something like this? How did it turn out? What are your suggestions? Okay, that is the end of the first update update but now we're going to get into a few replies to comments that op has left down below so one user asked op if he fought for custody i did fight for custody but they were all old enough that the court considered their preference and the situation and only granted me visitation a part of that was also because i didn't have the means to get a place large enough for all four girls my son my girlfriend and myself I still don't have room for them in my current apartment and being a mostly stay-at-home dad did not give me the experience or education to get a good enough job to support them here if i had the choice i would have chosen my ex and family over my affair partner another user then asked op if his affair partner is his son's mother she is i got baby trapped during the affair something again that she admitted which i know makes this much worse i think i could have maintained a relationship with my girls even after the divorce if i didn't have to stay with her and didn't have a new baby then another user tells op that he abandoned his family for a girl half his age so he couldn't expect them to want anything to do with them now that is kind of where i'm coming from guys We need to be getting a little bit harsh with this guy. I didn't abandon them, replied OP. I didn't leave my family for my girlfriend. I wanted to stay with my girls and my ex and work this out. My ex refused because the girls already knew about the affair and it wouldn't be setting a good example. And there was going to be another child involved that she wanted nothing to do with. But to be clear, I would have stayed with my family after the affair if given the choice. Yeah, okay, but it's easy to say that once you're the one that's cheated on your wife. The affair was a stupid mistake born out of curiosity since my ex was the only woman I've ever been with. It was not something I was committed to or wanted to continue long term. Is OP really trying to justify this at the moment? I'm confused. This is awful. Then another user asked OP if he and his ex had a conversation about exploring their sexuality and why he sought the affair in the first place. I brought this up before and we did have honest conversations about it. We've been together since middle school and have been each other's first and only. She loved that. She had no curiosity about other people and thought it was special that we'd only had sex with each other. And she's a very monogamous person in general. She couldn't even handle the thought of me being with someone else. If I wanted to be with someone else, it would have to be as a single man. And I didn't seek an affair. My girlfriend pursued me strongly and it just happened. Oh my God, dude. She got pregnant quite early into it. I didn't really plan on anything. Oh, here we go. A great response to that comment. Just happened, huh? What, you accidentally fell into her? I could not agree more with that comment. Like, come on, man. And then finally, one more user asked OP, why not just separate from his girlfriend? I have to stay with her because she's a bad mother and I don't trust her with our son. If we split up, then she would have him at least 50% of the time. I would have left a long time ago, if not for that. Okay, pretty crazy so far. But now let's jump a couple of months forward to January the 26th, 2022, where we get the final update of this story. Good news. My girlfriend and I have broken up. She's gone back to her home country and left my son with me. Refused to sign any formal custody agreement. So I'm hoping she stays there and doesn't bother us again. I'm pretty sure if she comes back and demands time with him, I have a good case for maintaining in custody she's not even interested in facetiming with him so he remembers her i feel bad that my son has to deal with a trashy and absent mother but i hope i can get him into therapy as he grows that is such a sad opening paragraph my word now the bad news i've tried my best to insist on visitation with my daughters and that has fallen through they absolutely refuse to see me they wrote me a letter together that says how much they hate me how betrayed they feel how they'll never forgive me and how my son will never be their brother to not even bother telling him about them because they'll never be in interested in knowing him just to forget about them altogether and move on with my new family i have no legal recourse the youngest is 13 now old enough to have a say in custody agreements and i don't think forcing them to see me would do me any favors long term anyways they also included pictures of their mother's wedding my ex has no obligation to tell me about her personal life but i'm pretty fuming that there's a man living with my daughters that i didn't know about 
Ah, now you know it feels, my friend. It's a family friend that has been in their lives for 10 plus years. So not a total stranger, but it still hurts to see pictures of their recent wedding and family pictures with my daughters. They mention that they have a father figure and don't need me anyways. Sorry, guys. I'm actually on the verge of laughing here. This is so ridiculous. How can you be upset by this? This has all come about because of your stupid actions. The whole thing really hurt. Yeah, I'm sure it did. How about getting cheated on by your husband when you have four daughters? That probably hurts as well. I know I have no right to feel hurt that my ex has moved on when I cheated on her. Exactly. But their whole relationship has moved very fast. So I'm now wondering if they started it before we got divorced. No way to know now. Doesn't matter anyways. Yeah, it doesn't matter because you literally had an affair. What, what is going on here? My ex agreed to keep me up to date and send pictures of my daughters once in a while. After dealing with my son's mum, I'm grateful that she is so good to our girls and that I don't have to worry about their well-being. I'm trying to focus on being a good dad to my son and patiently waiting for my girls to grow up and reach out. It may never happen, but I'm hopeful that they'll understand me more as they become adults and gain context for life. Oh my word, that is so patronizing. And let's end with this, the top comment on this post. Man ruined his whole life to get his pee pee wet for five minutes. Exactly. Now, this might just go down as one of the worst posts from an OP's perspective that I've ever come across. I mean, like seriously, this is an absolute shambles from start to finish. I actually just think that even though he's saying, yeah, it's my fault, oh, I shouldn't have done it. It still feels if he's not taken ownership for what he's done like blaming it on his new girlfriend saying that he baby trapped him all that stuff saying that it wasn't his fault she approached me she came on to me strongly what a load of absolute bull i still love my ex-wife i love my family i want to be with them if you really did you would never have done this i'm sorry it's just a fact uh, i don't know this guy just screams like picture the biggest red flag you can possibly picture as in on a world map bigger than america and that's his geezer. Also, I wonder how he'd feel if his girlfriend, now ex-girlfriend, actually cared for him and wanted to be with him and wasn't after him just for his money. Would he feel as bad? Would he feel the remorse? Would he be thinking, oh, I shouldn't have done this? Or would he be thinking, yeah, it's, it is what it is. Like, I did this on purpose. It was my choice. Like, that's kind of what I'd be inclined to think. Also, I just love the fact that he's like, oh, yeah, I know I cheated and had an affair and ruined my entire relationship with my children and my ex-wife, but... I don't like the fact that she's moved on and is with someone else who is actually probably a good father figure and your daughters now actually like having her around. It's crazy. The level of hypocrisy and just lack of guilt is unbelievable. If you are watching this video, my friend, you are an absolute disgrace of a man, but I kind of think you probably already know it by the comments that you got on this post. I feel like having a baby was a huge mistake. Now, this first post was originally posted on Reddit on the 1st of August, 2021. I'm her father. And no, I didn't have to push out the baby or carry her for nine months, but I don't think I've ever been more sad, exhausted, or depressed over a decision my whole life. Prior to the baby, I had lots of hobbies. I traveled the world, had a thriving, loving relationship with my wife and more. I built things, flew drones, worked on cars, and loved my Wall Street job but it all feels like that's gone. I have a nine week old and it has been rough. Nobody can really explain how demanding and exhausting and selfless you have to be to raise a child. I'm just grabbing at any moments of peace. And when she sleeps, I just wanna stay up and have a chance to be me. But I'm so tired that I can't even enjoy those moments. I find myself wanting to pack up and just disappear. I find myself not even wanting to wake up because I know what the day requires. When does it get better? When will I get seven to nine hours straight sleep every night again? When will I get a chance to live again? I don't get time with my wife. Love life is non-existent. I don't get to travel or do any hobbies I had. I work nine to 10 hours a day and I'm exhausted even before the day starts. I feel so guilty because she's beautiful and it isn't her fault. But if I could go back and undo this decision, I would. I know not all experiences are the same, but I'm hoping that someone has a positive word or a glimmer of hope for me. I hope I didn't ruin my life. An honest write-up from First Time Dad. And there we go. A rather depressing start to this one. You just don't really think about this. I mean, I know for me personally, this is not something I've thought of. Having a child would actually negatively impact my life in a selfish way. It's a tough thought that hasn't crossed my mind, but clearly it affected this man to a, to a great extent. However, this is, of course, best of Redditor updates. And therefore, there is an update. It was posted 
two years after that initial one, just a couple of weeks ago at the time of recording. I'm very interested to see if things turned out well or continued in the same vein. Okay, so this was written on the 31st of March, 2023. Hello everyone and happy Friday. I wasn't going to write this update as it's been so long, but I realized that we are a community and part of the power in community is in normalizing the experiences that we sometimes feel we go through alone. You are not alone and feel free to ask me any questions about my journey below. I'll do my best to respond to everyone. So what does life feel like at this point? Well, I could tell you what life is, but that's not how we connect as humans. We connect and function based on feelings and our perceptions. So with that being said, my heart has never been more full. My purpose has never been more clear. And while life has never felt the same, I'm not sure I'd ever want it to go back to the perfect life I had before my little girl. She is about to turn two. And every morning I look forward to my daddy, 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 as she runs into my home office after she wakes up. And I look forward to my big goodnight hug and goodnight daddy before she's put into bed. Her laughs absolutely obliterate the shadows cast from a bad day at work and chasing her on the playground at the park has become one of our favorite pastimes. When did it get better for you? Well, it gets better in stages, but I'm still not sure how much of that is because things actually get much easier or if there's a natural evolution we go through as first time parents. I remember feeling absolutely exhausted and without any time. Today, I get full nights of sleep usually. I have a few pockets to myself here and there, and while I don't get to sleep in late, stay up all night clubbing, or some of the more adolescent things I used to enjoy, I'm enjoying life again. And now OP has given us a timeline of his changing emotions. So, after four months, the first smiles were nice, but still not enough to change the quality of life. After 10 months, she started eating food, making lots of funny faces, and developed a fondness for me, even though I wasn't fond of her. Those long nights were few and far between, and while I didn't have free time, I had sleep. And we all know that sleep is extremely, insert curse word here, important after the initial exhaustion in the earlier stages. After 13 months, a mobile baby is a whole new challenge, and putting on the baby shows wasn't enough to keep her happy. It's again a shift where baby proofing becomes a huge deal, and you also look around and realize your space has been taken over by the baby. Baby stuff was everywhere. I was much less depressed, but ready to go back to normal life. Hint though, it never happens. After 16 months, the babies make huge growth leaps in this time. Playtime becomes much more fun, and suddenly you can start to do things like slightly longer car rides to your favorite food places, etc. I realized that half my beard has started graying, but oh well, it is what it is. After 20 months, words or babble and more babble and more words. This is a fun stage where exploration becomes a joint exercise. You find yourself enjoying rediscovering things you'd forgotten were so amazing. Swings and parks and baby appropriate bounce houses are commonplace. You also look up and realize that you survived the infant stage and you're now dealing with a full-blown funny toddler. They're weird, they're emotional, they're fun, they're loving, and they trust you to the edges of the universe and back. This was one of my favorite time periods so far. Emotionally, I realized I was no longer sad I had a kid, and I found that being gone from her for too long made me sad. Ugh, you start to feel like a real parent here. After 22 months, I love my little one so much. I love her so much that I want another. What is wrong with me? The period you hate goes by so quickly if you just hold on and keep your head down. I'm back to most of my favorite things, albeit with less time to enjoy. I love music, for instance, so I purchased a headphone amplifier and a 300 pair of headphones so I can enjoy it while I work. I have several toys I play with occasionally, but more than anything, I feel whole. It gets better. It gets better. And now I can't believe that I'm ready to have another. Those of you in this community that helped me were a godsend. I'm happy to be here and anyone can always reach out if they have questions or just need some encouragement. And there we go. What a start to the episode. I just didn't think that was going to have a happy ending, but I'm very glad that it did. Not going to lie. I was quite concerned after reading the post, but that is the beauty of best of Redditor updates. We get to see how things turn out and I for one loved it. Now, strap in, because more is coming right away. My boyfriend's friends pretended to kidnap me for a proposal. I am trembling, and I just created this alt account because my main has a lot of details about me that would make it easy to trace back. A week ago, my boyfriend told me he had a camping trip planned with his friends on Friday, today. He said he'd have no service and he'll see me on Sunday. He messaged me at 5 a.m. this morning and told me they're hitting the road. At around 8, I went for a run like I usually do on Fridays. 
I have one headphone in while I do because I was on a work call. While I was running, I noticed an SUV that kept popping up. In hindsight, it looked just like my boyfriend's childhood friend's car. I sent a message to my sister saying to stand by and shared my location. Right after sending the message, I looked up and the SUV was right beside me and someone jumped out and grabbed me. It happened so fast I even dropped my phone on the pavement. I was pulled into this car and I could tell there was at least two masked guys in the back before they covered my eyes. In hindsight, they had cartoonish ski masks and black gloves on. I freaked out and resisted like crazy, screaming and kicking. All I could hear was these guys laughing and I could feel one of them holding me down by my arms behind me and the other holding my legs down at my knees. I don't know how long I was in there, but I kept begging them to let me go and crying. I even admit I peed myself, but I don't think they'd noticed until we arrived at the house. They pulled me out of the car and I was screaming for help until I was pulled into the house. When the mask on my head was removed, I was on my knees in front of my boyfriend of two years. He was staring at me with a confused look before he started to angrily ask his friends what was going on. As I started to adjust to what was going on, I realized he was dressed nicely and there were romantic decorations around the entryway to the house. I realized who he was and what was going on and I collapsed into sobs I probably had a five minute panic attack in that car on my way there and another one sitting in the entryway to his house I was sweaty wearing soiled yoga pants flushed with fear scared for my life That was all about an hour or two ago My boyfriend took me upstairs and was going to help me get showered and changed but I wanted to do that alone I heard yelling and commotion downstairs while I showered but I didn't know what was going on I'm sitting in his room now holding my shattered phone after crying to my sister about what happened She lives an hour and a half away, but is speeding over to get me now I can't stop thinking about what happened and even though I know now that I was never in any danger I don't think my brain can comprehend it They were snickering and teasing me in deepened voices about what they were going to do to me The one that was holding my legs down kept caressing my thighs up and down into the inner area When the car would break, his face kept falling into my chest. I don't even know who that was. I just know that one of them sounded unsure and kept trying to defuse the situation. But I think it was the driver. Wow, what a crazy start to this story. As I said in the intro, there are many updates to come and we're going to get into them in just a few moments. But first of all, what do I even say to that? Comment down below, guys. What are your immediate reactions to what I've just read? I would love to know so many things. Like, I have so many questions and all will be revealed in the updates. But first thing that comes to my mind is, did the boyfriend really know how crazy this was going to be? Are they his close friends? Why did he do this in the first place? Why on earth were they touching you and, you know, getting close to you in that sort of way? Oh, it's crazy. I don't know if this was supposed to be some sort of prank that just went wrong. But the fact of the matter is, it was just a horrible, horrible experience for you. And OP, off the bat, before we get into any updates... I am so sorry that this happened. Okay, so first of all, in the comments down below, a lot of people were discussing whether or not the boyfriend was involved or to what extent he was involved. And OP had this to say. I don't think he knew how they were going to do it, but I wouldn't be surprised if he used the words kidnap and they took it too far. He's never given a red flag before, but if his friends are crazy like this, I need to reevaluate him too. I'm not sure and I don't want to immediately talk to him. I think I'm feeling traumatized or something because I just can't physically talk to anyone except my sister. Guys, remember that OP is writing this and responding to comments pretty soon after the fact, right? She's still in the house upstairs with her sister just a couple of hours after this all happened. The next question from the comments was if OP's boyfriend is from a culture where something like this is more common. But OP instantly says no. He's ethnically from the Middle East and I am from Eastern Europe. Very similar backgrounds, actually. We were both born and raised in America and we're both culturally and socially very Western slash American. And then finally, one commenter asks if OP could possibly stay with her sister and get some space from her boyfriend. And OP says that they don't actually live with their boyfriend at all. So either way, I'll stay with my sister a city away or she'll stay with me tonight. Okay then, so let's get into an update. This one was posted five hours later. I'm working with police now. This is going to be investigated as a false imprisonment if I press charges. My sense of time was so warped. From where I was picked up to his house was about 7 or 10 minutes in the car. But it felt like way longer than that. As for the friends, the driver was his childhood best friend who I actually get along well with. 
He was in tears when he voluntarily arrived at the police station for a statement. The other two were friends from his athletics class that he started attending a few months ago. It seems like the two guys I didn't know wanted in on what otherwise was supposed to be something more innocent. The original plan was for them to pop out of this car in their funny kidnapping attire and hand me a letter that explained I was being summoned by my boyfriend and that resistance is futile. It seems though like the plan changed as the two new friends wanted to shake me up a bit more and make it feel more real. Okay, so there we go. I guess a little insight into how involved OP's boyfriend was in all of this. Now you could argue that it's not really the boyfriend's fault because he didn't actually say to his friends to do this. It was them doing this themselves and it was, you know, just out of his hands. However, I would say to that, that he was the one who chose to kind of put this all into place in the first place. He was the one that employed his two friends to do this, right? Said, do this, do this. And ultimately, if you're going to be trusting two friends that you've only known for a few months in your proposal to your girlfriend, you know, the woman that you want to be with for the rest of your life, that's a very important moment, then that's kind of a bad thing for you to do, right? I mean, you're trusting two guys that you've barely known to do something that's so important. Very, very risky, and that ultimately is your fault, even though they obviously didn't do what you asked them to do. As for the two guys, I mean, they're just complete wrong-uns, right? Like, what are they doing? Seriously, what are they doing? The driver, fair enough, probably was focused on the road and was like, guys, what are you doing? This is very, very uncomfortable. And you can see the remorse later on in this post. But for the two guys themselves, like, how are you even mates with them in the first place? That is what I just don't really understand. Okay, now for the next update. I've had time to calm down and had long talks with my sister. We're going to meet up with my ex-boyfriend for dinner tonight. That's with a question mark, by the way. I guess unsure at this moment. He's been respectful of my request for space, but has been emotional whenever he thinks about what I went through this morning. His best friend contacted me repeatedly, apologizing for allowing it to get that far, but I asked for him to stop, and he did. The best friend's fiance reached out and has been supportive and apologetic too. I am astounded at the support I've received here and I wish I could thank each of you individually. I've never had anyone other than my sister and boyfriend care for my mental well-being like this. Reddit is a very kind place sometimes. And then finally, we got this update just a week or so ago. In short, I'm healing. My now fiance had a private proposal with me last week. Oh, wow. You know what? I'll be honest, guys. I really didn't expect that, but I was kind of hopeful. We had many tough conversations and his responses to everything reminded me how safe and loved I am by him. He didn't ask for or endorse that type of plan. I've learned that the two friends whom I didn't know were highly influenced by YouTube pranksters and social experiment channels. Also, one of them let us know he's on the spectrum and apologized for his part. Okay, fine, but just because you're on the spectrum doesn't mean you can go around actually properly kidnapping people. Come on. I think that's all I can share for now. I'm only consulting right now, and I may not actually press charges. Once again, thank you so much for all the kindness and support. Opening my inbox today warmed my heart incredibly. Now, there is one final edit from OP saying this. There are a lot of people who disagree with me staying with my fiancé. I'm sorry I couldn't explain in detail how confident I am in him throughout this. Please read carefully before passing judgments, and I'm sorry I couldn't please everyone with my decisions. But after further response, I think pressing charges is the best course of action. Maybe I'm a bit too tender-hearted, but I didn't want the former best friend to get some flack too, but it seems he has to. Yeah, that is a tough one right there. I don't really know how I feel about that. I think I completely agree with OP in reality. Yeah, you don't want the driver who is actually probably a good person, and it, it really wasn't on them was it? I mean, there was going to be a driver no matter what happened, even if OP had been handed the note as planned and it had been relatively fun, they were they were still going to be involved. So it's a tough one on their behalf. Uh, but ultimately, if you're going to press charges on those other two and you have to do that, and I'm really happy that you have done, then yeah, sadly, the driver, the childhood friend is going to be caught up in one way or another. But you know, if you show remorse and you say, look, I'm so sorry, I didn't expect it to happen like this. And I was just driving the car and it was all planned out like this. And you know, you get the boyfriend's uh, words and, and OP says that they really don't think the driver was was in the wrong really that much at all then the sentence in theory shouldn't be too bad on the driver but those other two i hope they actually go to jail not gonna lie because i don't know there was lots of different words that you could put in front of assault there that they did on op now as for your boyfriend slash now fiance i'm happy about that i am because i do feel like he just made a, a fatal error and it was a terrible error the sort of error that you'd really hope not to make at that stage in a relationship but still you could see that this is just not what he had planned 
at all. It went horribly wrong. It's a terrible shame, but ultimately, we're not going to know, guys. We're just reading one post and a couple of updates from OP. It's up to OP, and if, if she's happy with her decision and has had solid conversations with her now fiancé and feels that over the course of their relationship, this is just a blip, uh, who am I to say no? I, I think fair play for sticking with him and not just, you know, completely getting out of the relationship just from one terrible mistake. Now moving on to our next story. This one originally from r slash relationship advice and there are a lot of updates to come. My husband and son both lied to me. I am a 34 year old woman. My husband is a 36 year old man. We've been married for 12 years. A few weeks ago, my husband said that he has seen another woman handle situations that he didn't think I would be able to handle. I tried to talk to him about why it bothered me and he just told me it was a passing comment and that I shouldn't take it so seriously. He said he'd meant to simply compliment her by saying she was handling so much on her own and that he was impressed by it. But I told him it was completely unnecessary and hurtful to compare her to me to compliment her. He told me I was being unreasonable and jealous and that he didn't mean anything by it. After that, he didn't say anything else about it, so I dropped it. Then yesterday, when I came home from work, I saw a pair of women's Fendi sunglasses on our kitchen island, kind of hidden by our fruit bowl. I picked them up and I asked my husband whose they were. He looked confused and was like, aren't they yours? And I said, no. Our older son, 11 years old, is sitting at the kitchen table and goes, Oh, those are my friend Allison's. I took them home by accident. I was immediately suspicious. These are very expensive sunglasses. I know Allison's mother, and she doesn't seem like the type to let her child bring something worth that much money into school. My son kept insisting they were hers, and that he'd just taken them home accidentally on the bus, and that he'd return them to her tomorrow. But I said no, that I'd return them to her mother in person so I could make sure they got to them safely. When I spoke to Alice's mother, she confirmed that they weren't Alison's and that neither she nor her daughter owned sunglasses like that. When I told my son and my husband, they both feigned ignorance. My son went from saying that he could have sworn they were Alison's to, well, maybe not. Maybe I don't know whose they are. And then my husband said that he does remember taking the sunglasses out of our son's backpack when he was getting out his lunch stuff. My younger son, who is nine, just came home and recognized the sunglasses. They are Noelle's, the woman my husband helps out sometimes. The one who he told me to not be upset over comparing me to her. I'm going to confront him when he gets home. I don't know what to say to him. I feel as though I'm going to immediately burst into tears. Can someone please give me advice as to what to say and also just general advice, please? I never thought I'd be in this situation. Well, before we get into the update and we get the reveal of what exactly is going on here, I'm going to be honest, I don't have too much confidence. I feel like OP is in a world of trouble and yeah, ultimately, it's very likely that you're being cheated on. As as much as it pains me to say it and it's going to be a horrible experience for you, I think that's what's going on here. The thing that's absolutely mental to me and that I can't quite work out is why your son is covering for your dad. Like to do that, to actually lie about something like that in the knowledge that you are lying, right? Normally you just say, oh yeah, I don't know whose they are, but you're lying for a reason. There's no other reason to lie than to cover up for your dad. Why are you doing that? You're 11. It makes me think that that surely the dad has been in the 11 year old's ear and told him that which is even more crazy. Imagine cheating on your wife and then telling your son to help you out and cover up your infidelity. Is that really what's going on here? That's the thing that I can't get my head around. But nonetheless, let's get in to the reveal. Okay, so this was posted just one day after the original. When he got home, my husband admitted they were Noelle's. She's been over there while I was at work. My husband had not realized they were hers. He thought they were mine, which is why he didn't move them. My older son realized whose they were immediately, which is why he lied about them. He knew I was about to find it all out and was trying to cover. My younger son recognized them because apparently they've gone with Noel numerous places on my husband's days off while I was at work. I don't know what he told my older son, but he told my youngest not to tell me about Noel and her son hanging out with them because I would feel bad about being left out because I was at work. What? the heck i returned the glasses to noelle who seemed horrified she was under the assumption i knew about their hangouts i asked her why she thought it would be okay she looked really confused and told me why would i care if we were separated anyway wow i told her we absolutely were not separated we were very much still together 
Apparently, my husband told her we'd not been together except for cohabiting and co-parenting for months now. I confronted my husband with this information and he didn't deny it. He apologized but said he had developed feelings for Noelle but didn't want to risk our marriage until he knew if they were true feelings or just attraction. He left the house. Noelle wants nothing to do with him because now she knows the truth. He lied to her as well and she is furious i'm speaking to a lawyer today i'm not going to speak to him again except through lawyers since i don't have anything else to say to him and that right there is the definition of a modern day rat simple as that sorry but uh it's true you can't you can't just be doing that sorry it's actually so crazy that i have to laugh at that sort of stuff uh let me just try and you know see if i want to cheat on my wife with this woman but i'm not entirely sure if i want to lose the the guarantee of of having sex with my wife and the comfort of that relationship until i know for sure that i can have a new one so we're just gonna do this as like a like a kind of like a free trial you know you know when you sign up to amazon like yeah you get a 90 day free free trial but you don't have to actually pay any money. I'm gonna do this with Noel for a little bit, but um, I can always just go back to my wife if it doesn't work out. Oh, actually, no, I do like Noel. Um, are we gonna are we gonna jump ship? Nah, let's just do both for a while and lie to both of them, and then eventually get found out, thankfully, and both of them have left, which is good because that is what you know this guy deserved to have happened to him. What an absolute disgrace of a man. Um, now, you know what? I thought about it. As for the eleven-year-old kid, that is just a tough position to be in. I don't blame him at all, actually, because you're eleven. You probably want to keep your your parents together, right? That's the dumb thing. You're not really thinking, you know, I mean, you're 11, right? So so you're probably just going to gonna make up a lie or whatever and, and try and keep the peace. Don't blame the kid. Completely blame the dad. And again, OP and Noel, because you were lied to as well. I'm very sorry that you were put in this truly awful situation. I'm leaving my boyfriend over a prank. I'm still a bit shaken up. So if this doesn't make much sense, I apologize. I am an 18 year old woman and I've been with my boyfriend who is 20 for almost two years. I moved in with him last August and things have been pretty rocky. My whole life, I've struggled with my mental health, specifically depression, anxiety, and SH. I've been clean for a while though. I also have a history of trauma, but I don't need to get into that. I made sure my boyfriend knew this when we started dating because I wanted him to be able to nope out of the relationship if that was too much for him to deal with. He assured me it wasn't an issue. He never really seemed to get the whole mental health thing though. He'd make comments saying stuff like depression is just spicy sad and people with trauma should just get over it. He also thinks that only veterans can get PTSD. I've tried explaining things to him, but he just brushes me off, so I do the best to ignore him. Recently, he started watching couple prank channels on YouTube, and he started pranking me. At first, it was just small things like putting way too much flavor in my water or salt in a bite of my food. I laughed it off. It didn't really bother me. But then he started jumping out and scaring me. That kind of stuff really affects me sometimes because of my PTSD. And I tried to explain that to him. He would apologize, but then do it again the next day. I was getting annoyed and frustrated, but I tried to let it be. Things escalated last week when he put some noisemakers under the toilet seat in the middle of the night. I woke up to go to the bathroom and sat down. Boom. It being late at night, me being half awake and the loud noise all mixed together gave me a full-blown panic attack. I was on the bathroom floor crying and having flashbacks. After I don't know how long, I stopped crying and was just staring into space, having flashbacks. He came in because I guess he noticed I was gone for a while. When he saw me sitting on the floor, he remembered his little prank and started laughing. I just stared at him for a second, got up and called him a jerk. I slept in the living room the rest of the night. The next day, I sat him down and I told him he cannot keep scaring me like this. No more jumping out at me. No more loud noises. He pretty much sighed and rolled his eyes, but he said he would stop. Everything was fine for a week. I thought this whole prank thing was finally over. Yesterday, I got home from being out with a friend, actually feeling better for the first time in a while. When I walked in the house, all the lights were off, so I assumed he was still at work, which isn't abnormal because sometimes he works late. I plugged my phone in because it died on my way back home, and when it powered on, I got a notification that he sent me a text. It just read, so sorry, I love you. I replied saying, it's okay, I'll see you when you get home, love you and I heard his phone ding in the bathroom. That was weird, I thought. I got up to go get his phone, and when I got into the bathroom, I saw him laying in the bathtub. The bath was full of water. There was an empty bottle of pills on the sink, and he was covered in blood. 
His wrists were cut and there was just so much blood. My heart just sank. I started having a panic attack. I was hyperventilating, crying, and I was just frozen. After a minute, I ran to the living room to get my phone to call 911, and I hear splashing and then laughter. I turn around to see him standing in the hallway, just laughing. He said he got me, and I should have seen the look on my face. I don't even know how to describe the feelings I was experiencing. I was so mad and sad and scared. I didn't even say anything. I just walked out of the house. I just kept walking, and eventually I figured I needed to call my friend to come and get me. At first, I didn't tell her what happened. I just told her I needed her to come and get me. It was an emergency. She came and took me back to her house where I'm at now. My boyfriend keeps calling me and he sent me some texts saying he was sorry and that it was just a joke and I'm overreacting and I need to come home. I'm not answering. I don't even know what I would say to him. My friend is going over to his house tomorrow to get my things when he's at work. She said I can stay with her however long I need. I don't know what I'm going to do. I just feel numb. Wow, and there we go. What a first post. Let's get straight into an update which came just one day later. Thankfully, today wasn't as eventful as I was expecting it to be. I ended up sending my now ex-boyfriend a text saying that he crossed the line and I don't want to hear from him again. I blocked him on everything after sending that and I'm planning on changing my number tomorrow. My friend went over to his house around noon today with her boyfriend and was able to retrieve most of my stuff without issue. She got all my personal documents, sentimental items, medication, and clothes. The only things she wasn't able to grab were the TV and Xbox I paid for because I'm not sure how I can go about getting those back without him accusing me of stealing them. I'm not sure that fight is even worth it right now. Before she left, she put my copy of his house key on the kitchen table so he knew I didn't have it. She wanted to unplug his fridge and all his appliances just to make things harder for him, but I told her not to. I really didn't want to add fuel to the fire. His mum reached out to me to ask what was going on. Apparently, he called her and told her that I had some sort of mental breakdown and ran away and that he was worried about me. I told her what happened and what he did. She was fuming. She said she thought she raised him better than that and that she was sorry he did what he did. She said that if I need anything, I can let her know and she'll do what she can to help me. I guess his mum told his older sister what happened and she also reached out to me to apologize for his behavior. Now, I wasn't close to her, but I met her a few times and she is a really nice person. She offered to help with anything I needed and told me that she was going to make sure everyone knows what actually happened. I told her that wasn't necessary, but I appreciate it. But she said that she wasn't going to let her brother get away with this. I'm not going to argue, so I thanked her. For the most part, I've just been lying in bed today. I'm so exhausted, physically and emotionally. I wish I'd left him sooner. There were red flags that I just ignored. I guess I was afraid of being alone. I don't know. I'm trying not to blame myself for this whole situation, but I feel like I put myself in this position. This is what I get. I'm not expecting much else to happen. God, I hope nothing else happens. I'll probably give one more update in a few days as long as things have cooled down. If something significant happens, you'll hear from me. Thank you all for your kind words and your advice. It's very much appreciated and definitely needed. And as of the time of recording, that is the last update we've had up to this point. I guess there's not really too much more to come, right? OP's broken up with him. That really, I hope, should be the end. Now, I can't help but agree with your last point there, OP. I saw some red flags right off the bat. I mean, literally in the second paragraph of this entire thing, when you said that your boyfriend doesn't get the whole mental health thing, it's something that is so pertinent to your life that you've tried to explain to him. And for him not to get it, you just can't be a match if that is the case. I'm sorry. He just can't. Not to mention the fact that he's then going on and doing these ridiculous pranks. In the full knowledge, by the way, that you suffer from PTSD, anxiety, depression, etc., etc. Yeah, from that moment, even the first initial pranks you probably should have been like uh what's this guy doing let's get him gone but you know you've given your reasons you didn't want to be on your own i get it it's a tough spot for you but my word thankfully you got rid of him very very quickly after he did that ridiculous prank and for those listening on audio i'm i'm doing you know air quotes here what has happened to the whole pranking scene i mean thankfully the pranking scene on youtube did seem to die a few years ago with ridiculous pranks like that one somehow going viral and getting crazy views i think the word prank has been lost in translation over the past 10 years or so used to be fun and funny now it's oh look there's blood everywhere and i might be dead but it's just a prank bro yeah very very strange 
let's carry on. Okay then, now for our next best of Redditor updates post. Am I the jerk for leaving my boyfriend and his friends behind after agreeing to be the designated driver? I am a 33 year old woman and my boyfriend who is also 33 of four years is a big football fan And he has a tradition of meeting up with his high school friends at a bar for super bowl every year It's often the only time in a year he gets to see some of those friends because they're busy with their families and life I don't like football So i'm happy to be able to drop him off somewhere have an evening to myself and pick him up when he's ready to come home He tends to go hard with the alcohol when he's out with this group Last night, my boyfriend texted me that he was almost ready to be picked up, so I headed to the bar. He wasn't as ready as he made it seem, so I ended up going in and sitting down with them while everyone finished their round of drinks. He was pretty drunk, and he started getting handsy in a way that I wasn't comfortable with out in public, so I politely asked him to stop. I didn't want to make a scene, so I leaned in to whisper in his ear, asking to stop. He got angry though and whispered back, you should consider yourself lucky that I'm going home with you. I could go home with any woman here if I wanted to. He couldn't, but he's always been a dreamer. I was taken aback as he's never said anything like that to me before. I get he was drunk, but still. Anger set in and I excused myself as if I was going to the bathroom. I ended up leaving and texted him to let him know I left. Unfortunately, he'd arranged for me to drive two of his friends home too. Wouldn't have been an issue, but he also hadn't communicated that with me. Instead of calling an Uber or taxi like I assumed he would, one of his friends called his wife. The wife had to wake their toddler up to go and pick them up. Sorry, that's even more dumb. What what am I reading? My boyfriend was furious when he came home and still is this morning. He slept on the couch and we had an argument before he left for work. He says I embarrassed him by just up and leaving. He vehemently denies saying what he did doesn't recall getting handsy and insists he wasn't that drunk last night i also got an angry text from the wife saying i was a jerk for leaving them drunk and stranded forcing her to wake up her toddler to go and pick them up she also had a vague passive aggressive facebook post calling me out now i'm questioning whether i overreacted maybe i should have just brushed off his comment because he was drunk and followed through on the commitment i made I just felt so disrespected by what he said after I asked him to stop doing something that was making me uncomfortable. So, am I the jerk for leaving my drunk boyfriend and his friends stranded after the Super Bowl? Okay, guys, before we even get into the update, I have to give my thoughts because there is absolutely no way for so many reasons that you are the jerk in this story. I mean, that's just 100%. It's not even up for debate. It's so not up for debate. I don't even know if it's worth talking about. What I actually want to focus on is who is worse your husband for making those disgusting comments and then being upset that you left after you told him not to make them or his friend for calling his wife to go and pick them up in the middle of the night waking up the toddler to go and do it when you have just said you could have got a taxi or an uber like which is worse and then also the wife being angry at you for not doing it rather than at her husband i don't know okay fine obviously your husband is worse but still from their perspective as a group surely you just get a taxi get an uber like split it it would be so cheap i don't get it if there's an uber available you get an uber you don't call your wife that's just weird especially in the knowledge that you have a toddler at home are you really going to expect your wife to come and pick up loads of drunk guys bring the toddler with her because you can't leave the toddler alone at home yeah i mean logic's gone out the window here clearly okay then just five hours later op posted this thanks for everyone's feedback responses and stories to answer a few common questions and comments first he's never said anything like he did to me before He can push my boundaries from time to time, but has always respected them when I've said no or stop. We've had a really solid relationship up until this point, but this has left me with a lot of questions. And I, for one, personally, guys, I'm not going to have the comment of, oh, he was drunk. You know, you can say weird things when you're drunk, fine, but that is like bordering on harassment. I don't care what sort of state you're in. You can't say that. And then also denying that you said it to a sober person. It's just not going to go down well. He doesn't go out often, but when he does, he usually binge drinks, especially with the group last night. He reverts to high school frat boy mode. Nothing wrong with that, in my opinion, by the way. The only problem is if your behavior then becomes like it did. This was his high school group of friends that I have limited interaction with. I've got my group of friends and then we also have our group of couple friends. I don't know the wife at all except for a couple of dinners over the years. 
Truthfully, his high school friends aren't my cup of tea, so I don't interact with them much. Now, the reason I decided to just slip away and text him was because I didn't want to make a scene. After what he'd said when I tried to set boundaries, I couldn't predict how he would react. I didn't want him shouting or saying something else demeaning out loud, and he was very unpredictable last night. It seems the wife wasn't told the whole story. I did respond to her text with an apology and explanation. Went so well that she left me on red and has left the Facebook status up. Speaks more to her at this point. Yeah, I got the indication and the inclination that she also wasn't the nicest of people, just based on her reaction. I didn't know until I got to the bar to pick him up that I was also driving his friends home. In normal circumstances, it wouldn't have been an issue at all. A heads up would have definitely been nice, but I probably should have ensured rides were arranged for them before leaving. No, that's not your issue. I've decided to stay with a close friend for a few days to figure things out. My boyfriend and I have built a life together, but I'm not sure we can recover from this. I don't want our relationship to be contingent on stopping drinking or no longer hanging out with this group of friends or the promise that it won't happen again. From experience, ultimatums don't work and lead to resentments. All right then, and now moving on to the actual update of this post, which came on February the 14th, the next day. First of all, thank you to everyone who took some time to respond. I read as many of your comments as I could. Thanks for sharing some of your stories and I wish I could hug each of you that were or are in my situation. I really appreciate the support and also some of the honesty in the jerk judgments. Guys, it might be quite obvious, but just to say OP was voted pretty much unanimously as not the jerk in this story. Some of what happened could have been handled differently. I acknowledge that me leaving without saying anything wasn't the best of decisions in hindsight, but at that moment, it was the only decision I felt I had given the shock of what happened and the flight response it triggered. I've done a whole lot of reflection. I don't know why this incident was the catalyst because looking back, there's a lot I let slide at the cost of my self-worth. I had my blinders on and ignored things I shouldn't have, which I'm embarrassed to admit. However, I still felt like we could work through things. At the very least, we needed to talk. I'd hoped that we could have an open conversation about what happened and ideally a plan to move forward. So, my boyfriend and I met up today for the Valentine's dinner that we had reservations for. The dinner was pretty emotional and didn't go as I hoped. I apologize for leaving his friends stranded as a way of me showing to him that I took responsibility for my actions, even though I feel even more justified thanks to you guys, but he unfortunately wasn't willing to do the same. He still denies doing and saying what he did, despite remembering everything else that happened while he was at the bar. And he actually doubled down again about me embarrassing him, now not only by leaving them at the bar, but for also having the audacity to respond back to his buddy's wife He said that they were his friends and I had no business airing our laundry to them or involving them in our issues. Oh my God. This guy is worse than I actually thought he was. My word. I just can't comprehend how someone who supposedly loves me can't accept responsibility for his actions or at the very least acknowledge he hurt me. He obviously doesn't respect me. It's done and over. I can't do it anymore. We're going to go our separate ways. I told him as much. We own a house together, so it's going to be a process, but I feel oddly content with my decision. So thanks again to all you internet strangers that lifted me up and offered supportive words. I could not have walked out of the restaurant so confident in my decision if it wasn't for you guys. Wow, the power of Reddit. I'm back at my friend's place now with a hot cup of tea and Woman's Worth by Elisa Milk on repeat. As the lyrics say, holy heck, I'm tired of loving a man who acts like a child. And holy heck, I'm done with losing my mind just to love someone. And I am. I'm done. And there we go. Great decision by OP. What has shocked me there is that you've been together clearly with this man for quite a while. I don't know if you explicitly said, actually, no, you did, didn't you? Didn't you say you've been together for what? Four years? Is that right? Yes, you've been together for four years and this is the first sign, it seems to me, and obviously we only are going on off of what we've just read here, that he's ever got that side to him. The side that remembers everything else on a night, but then can't remember that one thing that you're talking about and also refuses to apologize for it. Now guys, I can only think of something that happened to me, which was very similar in this situation. It was actually with my um, ex-girlfriend before we were together. We were just seeing each other. And I had a moment like this. I had a night where I was with her and her mates and also my mate. And I got way too drunk. And I didn't say anything like this. I, I don't, honestly, like, I'm not a great geezer. 
but I would like this is ridiculous. I wouldn't say any of this stuff. This is just obscene. However, I did get too drunk and I pretty much wasn't aware of my actions. And it turns out I was kind of ignoring her. Now, look, fair enough. I don't remember any of it because I was absolutely battered. Don't do this, guys, if you're watching. Trust me, it wasn't great. Um, and she was upset because it was like a first big night out and I just got so waved. Uh, and it was a lesson for me. However, we talked about it. I fully apologized. I had no idea what I'd done, but she was telling me some of the stuff I'd done. And I was like, okay, honestly, in that moment, that wasn't me. I'm so sorry. I don't remember any of that. I would never do that again. I, I, I wasn't sober, obviously. But the point being that in that spot, I wasn't saying, oh, I don't remember doing that. Therefore, I can't apologize for it. I was like full on apologizing for everything that I'd done because of course I had no idea if I'd done it or not, but she said I had, so therefore I had. And therefore, the fact that this guy isn't doing the same is just kind of crazy. Like you can do bad things. If you apologize for them and say, look, I'm sorry, it won't happen again. I really genuinely am sorry. Then what more can you do? It's safe to say, I haven't had a moment like that since. So I've learned from that. And clearly this guy hasn't because he's now not in a relationship. There you go. Just getting back to the actual post now. Just, I'll, I'll just based on what I said at the start. I can't quite get my head around the fact that this is the first time that he's ever done something like this. I just, I just can't see how that's possible. That after four years, this is the first time that something like this has happened, and it's to such like a drastic extent. Like this is a pretty major incident. Not just what happened on the night, but the fact that he doesn't take any responsibility for it afterwards, and then even goes in on you. Like you're the one apologising when you never should need to. And he isn't. That's crazy. Maybe if you think about it now that everything has been and gone, as we saw in the first post, you'll think back to more red flags that could have shown themselves earlier, which you just didn't really clock or maybe just didn't see as that big of an issue at the time. But looking back now, you're like, ah, it all adds up. I mean, I at least hope that's what's going to happen because otherwise, if somebody can just switch up on you after four years of being in a relationship, that doesn't fill me with much confidence, I will say. But there we go. Great story nonetheless. I thoroughly enjoyed it. My 37-year-old man, wife's 34-year-old woman, sister, 29-year-old woman, try to kiss me. And now my wife is spiraling. Help me. As the title says, my wife's sister made a pass at me at a recent family gathering and I have no idea what to do. For context, I think my wife, Jenna, is absolutely gorgeous, but she has some really negative body image issues. This is in large part because of her younger sister, Mary, who is very conventionally attractive, as opposed to Jenna's more unconventional, but in my opinion, striking beauty. Mary was a successful model until a couple of years ago and now works in the fashion industry. In her early days of dating, when I would tell Jenna she is beautiful, she'd always say, just wait until you see my sister. When I did finally meet her family, she would randomly press me for weeks to talk about her sister, whether I thought she was more attractive than her, etc. I always told her the truth, that I think Mary is attractive in a boring way, and that I think my wife is much more beautiful and interesting to look at. She wouldn't let it go until I confronted her about how uncomfortable it made me, and I asked her what was going on. This is when she told me that she's always had a chip on her shoulder about her looks because of being compared with her sister growing up. They fell into the classic smart one, pretty one dynamic their whole lives. She also said that Mary had a habit of being flirty with all of her exes and warned me that it would happen to me eventually. She then started sobbing and begging me to not cheat on her with her sister, to which I forcefully said that I would never cheat on her with anyone, let alone her sister. I've been crazy about my wife since day one, and there's literally no woman on earth who could come close to her. I honestly didn't believe her about the flirting at first. I assumed it was just an extension of her insecurity. But I was wrong. Whenever we get together with my wife's family, Mary always finds ways to touch me and make little innuendos and comments about me or my body. It's super uncomfortable for everyone, especially my wife, and I've called Mary out on it before. She'll call it for a while, but eventually started doing it again. It's been six years of this, and every time it happens, my wife is upset for days, and I have to do a lot of reassuring. So on to the current problem. A few days ago, we were at my mother-in-law's birthday party and Mary asked me to help her grab some things from the garage. As soon as we walked in, she turned and pressed me up against the door with her whole body and started trying to kiss me. I immediately pushed her off and asked her what the frick she was doing. She started giggling and saying she was just doing what we've both been thinking and kept insisting, you know you want to. I told her she was out of her mind and ran out of there. I went straight to my wife and told her we were leaving. The whole ride home, she was asking me what was wrong. 
I wasn't sure whether to tell her because I knew how much it was going to hurt But I also thought that mary would probably try to spin it as me making a move on her So I knew I had to just say it I told her everything and she cried the whole way home for the last several days Mary has been calling and texting my wife doing exactly what I thought she would do Even telling my wife that I said that she mary was the hottest girl i've ever seen Which I had to assure my wife a million times that I did not and would never say even though she believes my account of the situation She's been a complete wreck the last several days. She's hardly eating She pulls away from my touch when I try to hug her or just hold her hand She says she feels hideous and disgusting and I don't know what to do This is the lowest i've ever seen her and it hurts to see how much she's hurting I have no idea what to do to help her heal from this reddit what should i do honestly guys i I kind of have no idea what to even suggest here you've been doing the right thing in my opinion for such a long period of time now this is obviously such a deeply ingrained issue that your wife's had to deal with for pretty much her entire life right i mean it happened when she was a child it's happened with all her exes she's always had this comparison with her sister and the fact of the matter is she's right about her flirting with her exes which is absolutely crazy so it's not as if her worries and her fears are not without actual evidence as as we saw you know she actually does do this sort of stuff she tries to kiss her sister's partners unbelievable so because of all of that it's gonna be an extremely extremely challenging thing to try and get her to not think these sort of thoughts and to reassure her that no i really do love you and i don't care about your sister at all when she knows for a fact that her sister is making passes at you it's just an incredibly difficult one and i really don't even know what to do what can you do other than just keep doing what you've already been doing which kind of hasn't really been working anyway good news is this is best of redditor updates and there are a couple more updates to come the first one that i'm about to get into was posted just a couple of days later here we go i got a few requests for updates so here it is I first want to thank everyone so much for your advice. It was extremely helpful and gave me a lot to think about. I'm especially thankful for the folks that asked me how I was doing. I realized that I've literally never had a chance to check in with myself after these things happen. And I've actually been holding a lot of frustration and resentment about it all. I've been harassed for years and it's either been brushed off or it's been eclipsed by the impact it has on my wife. I don't blame her for it, but this has been a good lesson in me not burying my feelings for the sake of others even for her. I also want to clarify a couple of things that came up. Several people asked about how my wife's family feels about all of this. And I explained in a comment that her parents are toxic and treat Mary as the golden child. Even though my wife is a freaking neuroscientist, amazingly talented musician, speaks three languages fluently and another two conversationally. My wife and her family are seriously the only people who don't seem to understand how exceptional she is. I remember meeting one of my wife's family friends and talking to them about her research and they said Oh, wow Her parents just told us she works at a university Whereas my parents literally introduce her as the family genius to everyone It makes me so freaking angry to think about how her jerk family has stolen her shine her whole life She's literally a renaissance woman, but all they care about is looks and money Some folks asked me why I would ever put myself in a situation alone with Mary, given everything she's done. I have no good answers for that, other than I never thought she would actually try to do anything. That possibility just didn't exist in my head. I realize now that I should have seen this would happen eventually, and that I should have been less concerned with keeping the peace, and more concerned with shutting Mary's trash down before it escalated to this point. Hindsight is 2020. All right, I got to jump in here quickly. I completely disagree with that. It's ridiculous to think that you're never going to be in a one-on-one situation with your wife's sister ever, like what, in the next forever of your life. It's going to happen eventually. You shouldn't blame yourself for doing that. And also you were just being kind and helping out. That's not your fault at all. The situation was an inevitability. It's just a sad one. Anyway, on to the updates. The night I posted, I told my wife that if she wanted to try to repair her relationship with her sister, I would respect that but that I don't feel comfortable being around her for the foreseeable future. I said, Mary has obviously been deeply jealous of my wife her whole life because she is a hollow, ugly person whose entire value has an expiration date while my wife actually has substance. I said that I think her whole family is toxic and has done nothing but put her down her whole life, but that only she can decide whether she still wants them in her life. Wow, and that answers my question as to what you should have done. That is the perfect thing to say. Brilliant. I also told my wife that while I don't blame her for her emotional reaction, her insecurity is something that she needs to work on for our relationship to be healthy. 
What Mary did was sexual assault and she's been sexually harassing me for years But i've consistently put aside my own feelings about this problem because of how it affects her And that has prevented me from getting the support that I need too I told her that her reaction only serves to punish herself and me for her sister's behavior And there's no reason to give her that kind of power I also told her something that a commenter said that really resonated with me The only people who have ever considered her second best are her and her family Everyone else sees her for who she really is. I've got to say op you are saying angelic words here Every single letter is perfect She was crying the whole time and agreed that she needed to go to therapy to work on her insecurity We were able to find a therapist who specializes in body image and self-esteem issues to work with her individually And we're looking for a couples therapist too My wife sent a message to her parents and sister that explained exactly what happened and told them she would reach out to them If she ever feels ready to repair their relationship We blocked all of them everywhere But mary has of course been spamming my family and our friends with nonsense claiming i attacked her that i'm a drug addict i abused my wife all kinds of bs that thankfully nobody believes my wife is still down in the dumps but i can see that things are getting a little better she's eating and sleeping more and she's cuddling with me in the mornings again which is nice now i'm planning a surprise getaway for us this weekend we're going to one of our favorite places and i'm going to wine and dine her and try to make her feel like the goddamn queen that she is i want to thank you all again for your help You really helped me understand the severity of the problem. And again, thanks for helping me connect with my own feelings about all of this. You guys are the best. But guys, fear not, because there is actually one more update that was posted on the 1st of February. So let's get into that. Hopefully, OP says it's the final update, but let's see. First, I want to say that I've gotten so many questions about who Mary is, and I'm just not gonna say. Suffice to say that she's never been household name famous, but she made a living solely on modeling for about a decade from what I understand. So she must have been popular enough that fashion people might know her. I really don't know how that world works, but in my opinion, It doesn't matter how many names you drop. You're not famous if you don't have a wikipedia page. That is fair enough Also got lots of comments that mostly jokingly called me a simp and I can't argue with that I totally am a simp for my wife. She's the coolest. I hope you all find a love that makes you feel this way I completely agree. If you're gonna simp for anyone in this life, it better be your wife. That is fair enough Okay, I think that's it. So here is the actual updates. My wife loved the getaway weekend We had a blast and by the end of it She said she felt like herself again for a few days after we got back things were really quiet So we were hopeful that mary had finally given up But I felt uneasy about it all many of you warned me that mary would try to interfere with my work And while I initially dismissed it, I figured I would reach out to my boss just in case I've been working at the same company for almost 10 years and she's heard me vent about mary before So I didn't have to explain too much My boss just reassured me that she knows my real character and would let me know if mary tried anything As predicted, Mary did try to contact my boss a couple of days later and the following is a recounting of what my boss told me Apparently, Mary said that I needed to be fired because I was a predator and she claimed to have proof that I assaulted her My boss said that that was a very serious accusation to make and asked Mary to explain what proof she had Mary claimed there was a camera that caught the whole incident So my boss asked her to send the video then mary got flustered and said the police had it So my boss asked her to send over a copy of the police reports Then mary said that it had a lot of private information in it So my boss asked her to redact the private information and send it over Then mary said that she didn't feel comfortable with that And my boss told her that she could not take action against an employee based on word of mouth from a stranger Then mary shouted at her for victim blaming and hung up But unfortunately that was not the end of it last wednesday mary somehow sent an email from my personal email account With a d pic not mine obviously to the entire office Oh my my best guess is that I must have left my email logged in on one of my in-laws devices She's definitely not smart enough to actually hack me and I know this is completely besides the point But of course she chose the weirdest looking d i've ever seen I played team sports all my life I've seen a lot of D's and this was something else. It's honestly kind of funny to think about Mary googling gross D or something And sifting through hundreds of images to find just the right one I had to apologize to everyone on staff and thankfully folks were surprisingly understanding 
It's actually been kind of a nice bonding experience with my co-workers. I honestly didn't consider myself to be super well liked in the office, but it feels like everyone has been going out of their way to be kind to me. And it means a lot. Anyway, at this point, it was clear we had to escalate things legally. I really wanted to avoid it, but she forced my hand. My wife and I have a lawyer friend who helped us draft a cease and desist letter outlining her continued harassment and the material and emotional damage this is causing us. My wife then sent a message to Mary and my in-laws with a copy of the letter and made it very clear that we would pursue criminal and or civil proceedings if her harassment continued. My wife's mum then called her crying and begged her to just let it go and leave Mary alone. My wife calmly explained that Mary is the only person responsible for this whole situation and that their parents have always enabled her awful behavior. She also says something that she later regretted, but I think it was pretty badass. Mary is going to stick you two in a nursing home and steal your money the minute she has the chance and you deserve it after the way her mum reacted my wife is firmly settled on cutting off her family completely this happened on friday and on sunday mary's best friend of me Anne, sent my brother a message on facebook to say mary is going to leave us alone and to please not sue her i told my brother not to respond then just sat and enjoyed the idea that mary was out there somewhere freaking out about the potential of having to actually face the consequences of her actions It must be such a strange feeling for her. Since then, we haven't heard a peep from the grapevine. It feels like things are finally starting to go back to normal. My wife is starting therapy next week and will be starting couples therapy in a month or two. She wants to do some work on herself first. She's also taking a short leave from work to rest and recharge. I'm so proud of her for standing up for herself with her family and finally putting her mental health and well-being first. Thanks again for everyone who offered advice. This was a messy situation, but it definitely would have been messier without your help. And there we go. A great story with a pretty good ending, I will say. However, my immediate reaction to what I've just read there at the end is I kind of can't help but think that there's more to come here. Mary is the sort of person that hasn't really not got her way, it seems, throughout her entire life. This might be the first time in her life that she hasn't got the desired outcome that she wants. Therefore, I can't help but predict that she's going to come back into your guy's life in one way or another. It doesn't even matter if she's going to get sued or if the law is going to get involved or whatever. I just don't think she's going to give up that easy. I really fear for what she might do next. Get in the comments, guys. Do you reckon this story is done or do you think it's just the beginning? I don't really know. One way or another, I really do feel like this is not going to be the last we hear of Mary and that she may well end up in custody pretty soon. Today, I effed up by telling my parents I was gay to avoid their arranged marriage proposals. So I'm pretty straight, maybe slightly bi if we count femboys. Let's get that out of the way first. I'm also an Indian American male around 26 years of age. I'd also like to clear up some misconceptions around arranged marriage. A lot of non-Indians seem to think it's literally your parents choose who you marry and that's that but that's not really the case. Instead, it's more like your parents tap their network to find potential partners for you. If you like each other's picks, then you guys meet in person, and then you decide whether or not you want to get married. So basically, your parents are Tinder, and you get a meeting or two to decide whether or not you want to get married. It's not quite as bad as many of you think it is, but the whole process feels super rushed, and I'd rather date someone before I figure out if we're compatible or not. Anyways, my parents have recently been getting on my case about getting married. Apparently, I'm getting older, need to settle down, and give them grandchildren, or something like that. Basically, every time I see them, which is fairly often since they live close by, they have a new potential match for me. A picture of some new girl and they asked me if i'd be willing to meet her it's honestly super annoying but i'm too non-confrontational to really put my foot down and say i don't want an arranged marriage after all if i do there'd be an argument or at minimum some interrogation about why i don't want one anyways i was thinking of ways i could get them to stop harassing me about getting married and the idea in the title popped into my head I decided it would be a lot easier to just come out as gay than to explain why I didn't want an arranged marriage. My parents were fairly conservative, but weren't the types to disown their kids. And if I just said I was gay, I'd have a solid reason to not get an arranged marriage. I didn't like girls. So that's what I ended up doing last time I was visiting. They were showing me pictures of some girl and I just looked at them in the eyes and said, Mum, Dad, I'm gay. They got really quiet and awkward and asked me if I was sure, and I said yes. 
My mum told me they'd love me no matter what and to do what makes me happy. My dad was a lot more awkward and quiet, but later gave me a similar talk about he was a bit uncomfortable with the idea, but recognizes that times are changing and I should do what makes me happy. Overall, I did feel kind of bad because of how genuinely my parents seemed to respond to me, but I was happy with the result. They stopped giving me arranged marriage proposals and stopped showing me pictures of girls. That is until last weekend. I visited them as usual and was greeted by my mum, who was more excited than usual. She sat me down and pulled out a binder with a bunch of pictures of guys. Apparently, my parents had spent the last month or so looking for any and all gay Hindu Indian men who I could potentially marry. So now I guess I'm dealing with the exact same rubbish, but instead of being greeted with pictures of cute Indian girls, I get to see pictures of gay Indian dudes instead. F my life. At this point, the plan is to either find a girlfriend and tell my parents that she totally turned me straight or maybe marry a twink or something. I don't know. Well, good thing is there's an update coming right up and let's see exactly how that plan goes and just what OP decided to do. This was posted just three weeks later. I read all the comments on the original post from the people telling me to just tell my parents, questioning whether or not I was really straight, laughing at the admittedly fairly funny situation I got myself into and a couple of people who were straight up mean. At the end of the day though, posting here probably gave me the final push to do something. The weekend after I'd made the post, I visited my parents as always and resolved myself to tell them the truth. However, when I got there, my mum, as always, pushed the binder into my hands and I kind of lost my resolve to tell her. I decided to just play along. It was then that I remembered the people on this thread who made fun of me for liking femboys and questioned whether or not I was really straight. I kind of took that to heart and decided to look at the binder of dudes in earnest to see if I liked any of them. To be honest, I'm really glad I did. Most of the dudes were unattractive as expected, but I found a dude on there who I legitimately think is cuter and more feminine than the vast majority of girls I've seen. I told my mum I liked him and she kind of joked around asking me what the point of being gay is when I wanted a dude who looked like a girl anyways. She talked to his parents. We had a meeting set up over Zoom and overall it went really well. Me and him have a bunch of common interests. We're both massive weebs and history nerds, and he also disclosed that he apparently cross-dressed in private, which only made me like him more. In the end, though, we both decided we didn't want to rush into marriage and wanted to do a dating trial run of sorts. I told my parents, and they were fine with it. My dad literally just told me that as long as we have marriage as an eventual goal and don't have sex before marriage, they didn't mind if we dated. Guys, Literally, this whole thing could have been avoided, though I'm kind of glad that it wasn't. Luckily, he lived in the same state as me, but he was still a three to four hour drive away. So mostly we've just had Discord calls and spent time together gaming for the past few weeks. This Saturday, though, we finally managed to meet up in person and have a date. And honestly, I think I'm kind of in love. The dude's cuter than any girl I've ever met, but unlike most girls, he's actually into the same things as I am. Anyways, we ended up having a great day out on Saturday, and I ended up staying at his place over the weekend. Though, surprisingly, I kept my promise to my dad and somehow avoided having sex. Anyways, yeah, I'm now back home and extremely happy with my decision to lie to my parents. Then again, is it really lying if it turned out to be true? I really, really do like him and will probably ask him to marry me a couple of months from now if nothing goes wrong. What a story. I can't believe what I've just read. Now guys, when I say in the intro that this is my favorite subreddit because of the variety, this is what I mean. But what have I just read? I can't quite believe the outcome of the story. If anything, it is rather beautiful. I will just say that. Mesmeric, um, very unexpected and pretty incredible. I mean, if this is not an advert for arranged marriages, then I don't know what is. Can I have one, please? Maybe not to a femboy, but amazing stuff nonetheless. I just can't quite believe how one thing led to another and ended up in you genuinely falling in love with someone that you didn't even think you could possibly be attracted to in the first place because of their gender. Like, what are the chances of that? Insane. And the beauty of it is that your parents are none the wiser. They think you're being serious the entire time. And maybe in your heart, you were. And there we go, guys. That is going to do it for this one. Really hope you enjoyed this compilation. You guys seem to be loving the compilations of late. You can just sit back, chill out, do whatever you're doing. You know, do some gardening, do some pottery, or maybe even have a lovely bubble bath. All while listening to my succulent tones. Succulent being a strange word there, but, um, you know, 
You get that from an outro after, after enjoying three hours of content. This is your reward, this right now. I hope you're enjoying it. As I said in the intro, I really hope the best of comes back online pretty soon because it's one of my favorite subs and the lack of posts I'm not enjoying. If you want to know a little bit more about what's going on, why it's not online, uh, why there's been a protest against Reddit, I'll leave a little link down below in the description where you can read about the, the changes to the API and what exactly the moderators on Reddit as a whole are not really happy with. Um, but for now, all I'll say is I hope it's back online pretty soon because I certainly miss it. If you want more content like this right away, check it out down below in the description. And with that all being said, I will see you tomorrow for some more Reddit stories.